Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I am said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of January 19th, 2024, including Xbox held a developer direct that gave us our first look at Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. We saw more Avowed, more Hellblade 2, and more. Halo's rumored Battle Royale mode is reportedly dead, and more. On this day in Xbox history, in the year 2016, eight years ago, Life is Strange Limited Edition was released for the Xbox One in Mexico. Yeah, it's uh, still that time of year where just not a whole lot of this year in Xbox release dates to go over, but hey, Mexico's a country too, goddammit. Uh, Life is Strange, I love the first Life is Strange game. I know it's like a meme to a lot of people, and I embrace that. It's funny, the game has god-awful campy writing. It's weird because like the game has... Great characters and a great story in very, very, very bad writing. It's, uh, I think the first Life is Strange is such a triumph in that it can show hmm, this isn't a good lesson to learn. And I don't, and I hope other developers don't walk away with this, but you can apparently you can have bad writing and still have endearing characters and, and an overarching story that is compelling and good. And this game proves that because I, I don't know, I really love the first Life is Strange, unironically. So, Shout out to that. Of course, that game was released episodically throughout the calendar year 2015. And then in 2016, they boxed it up as like a full complete edition. And that's uh, what this is referencing. I, I don't know. Did it come out a different day in Mexico than it did in the U.S.? I don't know. Apparently, this year in gaming, uh, this day in gaming, Mexico, you, you guys got the complete edition. Congrats, Mexico. Guys, welcome to Xbox on episode 242 of the podcast. Let's not beat around the bush here. We're all here for the same reason. We want to talk about Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. It's a stupid name, but the game looks fucking awesome. We want to talk about Avowed. The game continues to look awesome. We want to talk about Hellblade 2. We want to talk about Aura, or maybe we have to talk about Aura. We, we, got, we got games to talk about. I'm excited. I'm coming fresh off the developer direct. Uh, we delayed the podcast a week, or not a week, a day this week. Man, I'm really already struggling a little too much with the, the only language I know, but... Delayed the podcast so we could accommodate this big event, and I will say it's well worth it because as I am about an hour or two removed from the event, I'm just I'm 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 hyped, I'm excited, I'm ready to get into it. I got all my notes here. Now, just a quick little thing. Uh, obviously, we're gonna follow the normal format of the show. We're gonna go through the the small news stories of what I've been eating. So, if you're here just because you you want to get to the direct news, you don't you don't care about what I've been eating, which is I, I can't even fathom that you feel that way. Uh, you don't care about the smaller news items of the week, anything like that, then feel free to use the timestamps in the description, whether it's on YouTube or in a, or in a podcast service. There are timestamps in the description. Just hit on the one that says developer direct and uh, it'll take you straight to the part of the podcast you're, you're here for. Uh, but for the rest of you who are crazy enough to listen to all, I'm going to guess four, 4,000 minutes of this podcast, let's, uh, let's just let's start in the same way we always do with the notable game releases of the week. Here's our first notable game release of 2024. It's Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, the new 2D kind of old school style Prince of Persia, a little homage to the series before it, uh, it, it evolved into the 3D space, beginning with Sands of Time. And uh, apparently this game's really good. The reviews are in. People are super high on it. It's apparently quite a good game. It's out now as of the time I'm recording this, so you can go and play, experience it for yourself, get Ubisoft Plus, or go buy it yourself if you want to have the full experience, you know, own the game, so to speak. And yeah, Prince of Persia, I have nothing to say to this. I think the game looks good uh, myself, but I, I just, I'm not very versed in Prince of Persia, and this game is not going to be the one to make me uh, enter into the franchise. So I'm happy for those fans of the series that, that are enjoying this game. I'm happy for those who will discover Prince of Persia as a result of this game, but I have nothing more to say on it. So we will move on uh, to the mildly amusing stories, stories we use to just kind of, again, it's like if, if, if Xbox On is a four-course meal, then the mildly amusing stories and updates, these are your appetizers. And you know what? Here's the thing, guys. Sometimes you go to a restaurant and the entrees kind of suck, but 
the appetizers are good. So who knows? Some some weeks the mildly amusing stories are, are more amusing than the uh, generally amusing stories or the main news stories of the week. In this case, I don't think that that's that's true uh, because we got exciting developer direct news to talk about this week. But I will say, if uh, if, if episode two forty two is a restaurant, this is one of those restaurants where the appetizers are on fire, right? The entrees on fire. The dessert, meh. It's fine. It's okay. The restaurant's great overall because as long as you're killing it with the appetizers, the cocktails, the the entrees, dessert can be a little lackluster. It's always great if dessert's great, but whatever. I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. I just love talking about food, as you all know very well if you've ever listened to the show before. But uh, no, guys. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of stories in the top of the show that would normally be main news stories and that's kind of why i'm actually wasting your time preface prefacing but it's just the developer direct is obviously the main focus of this episode so stories that would otherwise be big stories are pushed up to the top so let's kick it off with some halo because it doesn't matter if the big news story of the week is that sachi nadella has grown wings and uh, flown to the moon and back that's still not the main news story for me if there is some halo news to discuss so halo always comes first it is my favorite child and therefore we begin with the halo news we got a double header here uh Eurogamer reports that's right well Eurogamer relays from a report from xbox era podcast but nonetheless quote the mysterious long rumored halo battle royale project from a series of co uh from series code developer certain affinity is no longer in development a report suggests speaking on the xbox era podcast reliable insider uh, I'm going to reveal how little I follow the Xbox community because I don't know how to pronounce this. Spiesel fucking Nick said that the game codename Project Tatanka has seemingly been canceled. And to clarify, Nick and the fellow co-host uh, John Clark state that the state that they have both been contacted about the project being canceled independent of YouTuber Colt Eastwood, who also said that he's heard the game is canceled. Now, I, know, I recognize Colt Eastwood, uh, though the pair doesn't seem to know for certain certain uh, while officially unannounced by Microsoft itself, certain affinity has been discussion discussing projects or a project publicly in broad terms um, several times over the years. They last said in late 2020, I don't know they said something more recently than that, but they said in late 2022 that they had been in the works. Uh, they had a game in the works for more than two years with nearly a hundred people working on it. They did mention the f- uh, project followed an early promise by certain affinity that it was deepening its relationship with the halo series. That was what they said more recently. Uh, core develop uh, the core developer 343 um, that they had reached a, a deeper relationship with them and that they had been entrusted with further evolving Halo Infinite in some new and exciting ways. The project was later discussed in a Bloomberg report on a, the future of 343 Industries, which stated that Tatanka had begun as a battle royale that may evolve in different directions. One thing I just want to say that I, 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 I never thought about until now is that when Bonnie Ross left and the studio got shook up and a lot of things changed for Halo about, I don't know, when was that fall of 2022? When all that happened, our understanding as the general public was that what was left of 343 was predominantly like the core multiplayer team and that like the campaign team had mostly just been fucking gutted and that a lot of like the visionaries of like where we're taking the universe of Halo had kind of all been shaken up or left or whatever have you. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm just now realizing that's like in a world where certain affinity, a team that specializes in multiplayer and 343, a team that has now been stripped down to just its multiplayer team, essentially um, are both, on Halo, I mean that. Hey, that's great. It means you can do some really badass Halo multiplayer stuff. But in order to make a proper Halo game, which we assume 343 is currently working on the next Halo game, it would uh, it kind of be redundant to have two companies working on multiplayer stuff when you need someone to be working on campaign stuff. So I I do wonder. I mean, there are many reasons why we could sit here and speculate about why the battle royale mode seems to have been internally canceled. Uh, but it it does. It does seem like they need someone working on a, a new Halo campaign, and three four three should be the primary developer working on, um, working on on a multiplayer suite for a new Halo game. And certain affinity is usually the additive team. So I I, I wonder what that means. I I'm still of the mind as many of you I know are 
that the best thing that they could do for Halo as, as pertains to certain affinity would be to uh, give certain affinity the license to, to the, the IP and say, go make your own Halo game. It doesn't have to be a traditional first person shooter. It can be something else, whatever you want to make. It doesn't have to be a mainline series game. It can be a spinoff, whatever the fuck you want to make, go make a Halo game. I like many of you uh, are very open to that idea. And I hope that's why this project is being canceled is maybe in, in favor of a certain affinity developed Halo game, which I think would be awesome. Or maybe they are moving on to Halo 7's multiplayer suite, and that's why they're not working on this Battle Royale. But remember, this isn't the first time a Halo Battle Royale mode has uh, reportedly been canceled because Halo 5, as the rumor still goes, we don't have any official word. Halo 5 had a Battle Royale mode in the works later in its lifespan that was apparently canceled and it, it apparently got really close to being shown at E3 one year in like 2017, I want to say, 18. And then got like, got the axe like last minute, basically. So I don't know. It seems like there's this like desire to do a, a Battle Royale thing with Halo, but it just, it never happens. And I don't know. It, it sucks because Certain Affinity is serious talent. And it just sucks that whatever it is they're working on behind the scenes, whether it be a, a full Halo game, a, a big Halo standalone experience like a battle royale or maybe just support work on the next halo multiplayer experience it just feels like certain affinity hasn't been able to really show us anything do anything flex their muscles show the show the world what they have to offer and that's that's the frustrating part to me more than anything i can take or leave a battle royale mode in a halo game um i i see why it's a good idea clearly it's a game mode that's sticking around it's not a fad and i you know whatever i, I i'm open to it I don't know. I, I wonder if this is in an effort to be like, OK, we got to do the Halo 5 thing again. Let's just go quiet for a second, get hard at work on the next Halo game, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll try this again in a few years. And maybe maybe the idea of like either supporting Infinite with a robust Battle Royale mode or doing an independent Battle Royale game that stands separate from the main series. Maybe that just uh, adds too much attention to Halo in a time where they're trying to lay low and maybe just uh keep their heads down and work on the next thing. But that can't be the case because the next story we're about to talk about uh, is absolutely something that is trying to keep Halo at the forefront of consumers' minds and and keep the franchise alive and, and active uh, because we're about to talk about the Halo TV show. So I don't really know what to say here. Hey, maybe it's as simple as the project wasn't coming together. I mean, right now there's a huge... There is a huge... Uh, not Exodus, but like, I don't know. There's a huge movement that's like happening all of a sudden where a lot of publishers want to move away from these games as a service or canceling projects or trying to retool projects or I mean the last of us just got its it's a live service multiplayer thing killed and it's it's not necessarily a testament to how bad these games may have been uh, behind the scenes it could just be that a lot of these publishers are seeing the writing on the wall and don't want to tarnish their their good brands like the last of us or halo by putting out Another live service game thing that will just get inevitably destroyed by the highly competitive market that is Fortnite versus uh, what's the one Valorant versus fucking Roblox. I don't know what what are, what are people playing there. There's only so much time and there's so many so many live service games. And I mean, you just got the finals, which is like, how the hell, how the hell did that succeed? It's just, you know, not to say the game's bad. The game is pretty good. It's just, it's such a crapshoot. There's so much buying for your time in this uh, games as a service space. And I wonder if maybe they felt like the best thing for Halo would be to just not try and compete in another place where it could potentially have its lunch eaten and instead just uh, retreat and continue to focus on fixing Halo as they continue to break Halo further and further. Speaking of breaking Halo... Season two of the Halo TV show <laughs> has, I don't know, is it two official trailers? I don't know. They've been, I've been seeing a lot of it on social media. The, the, the trailers, they're on the marketing blitz because the episode one of season two starts on February 8th. So in just a few weeks here, what is that? Is that like Super Bowl Sunday or something? That's like, that's like a few days before the Super Bowl. No, that's not. When's the Super Bowl? No, Super Bowl must be on the 11th. Why, why the fuck does that matter? I'm thinking, are they trying to launch a TV show the weekend of the Super Bowl? I don't think that necessarily is a problem. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, so Halo Season 2 from Paramount. It's, it'll be on Paramount Plus just like Season 1 was. I got to be completely honest with you. I'm trying to be positive. I, 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 don't, I don't love being negative. I'm aware that I come across as a negative person. I'm aware that's always how I've been. But I really do. 
I, I do host this podcast because I love Xbox and I want to express uh, the thing that I love and talk about it and have an outlet for that. So I'm not trying to be a hater here, but the first season of the Halo TV show just left me so incredibly apathetic that I I just couldn't I like in the in the most literal sense of the phrase I could not care less about season two of Halo. That being said, I I watched the trailer twice, not because it was so badass, but because once to the obligatory watch and two because I, I had to go back and watch it again a few days later just because I couldn't remember a goddamn bit of what I saw. And for all intents and purposes, the trailer looks good. It looks like they're leaning more into action, which is what the season one lacked. It looks like they're leaning more into Covenant and elites and battles and like something going on with Reach and maybe it's going to start to tie into some storylines we're a little more familiar with and less about a little random girl or a man who shows his butt cheeks and pretends to be Master Chief. I don't know. I don't know. It looks like an improvement. If I'm judging what I actually saw with season one uh, compared to the trailer for season two, season two looks like a step in the right direction. It looks like a marginal improvement and, and I'm happy for the people who are happy. But on a personal level, I could not care less. I, I can't be bothered to spend the five, seven, whatever dollars it, it is a month to resubscribe to Paramount Plus just to watch this show. Now, I, I am going just for the sake of trying to keep in the loop and, and, and maybe stay open minded. When this season wraps up, when all eight, ten episodes of the season, whatever it is, are done in a couple months, I will resubscribe to Paramount Plus for two reasons. One, because... I want to catch up on South Park. It's been a minute since I gotten to watch South Park. And two, because I'm going to give Halo Season 2 a try. I'm going to at least watch Episode 1, maybe 2. And if it's good, I'll stick with it and finish Season 2 so I can stay caught up. And if it's bad, I'm just going to respect the fact that it's not working for me and move on with my life. And listen, I wanted to like the Halo show. Even when the first two episodes of the, of the first season came out and people were pretty divided on them, I stayed optimistic. I was like, you know, they're showing a lot of Master Chief's face, but... I, I I appreciate them wanting to make their own Master Chief story. They can do this. It can be good. It can be different and be good at the same time. But as that as that season went on, not only was it bad, it was just so uninspired and boring. And, and season two has got a lot of work to do to prove to me that it's not going to be, above all else, uninspired and boring. Um, because it's one thing to show Master Chief's face uh, for like 87% of the time. Uh, but it's another thing to just you know, the cardinal sin of being boring entertainment. I like, why, why would I spend my free time being bored when I could spend my free time being not bored? Think about that for a second. As we move on to our next story, I know food for thought. All right, let's talk about something that's not boring. Something that is probably the biggest piece of news this week, if not for the developer direct. And it's a couple comments that Satya Nadella made uh, actually like a month ago that we're now getting reporting on. But this comes from Game Ranks uh, ranks that we're going to we're going to pull their their write up of the story. But uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella has made some interesting statements about their newly minted gaming division. Satya, along with Microsoft's president, Brad Smith, was asked in a panel last year back in December about the health and future of Xbox, as shared by Steven Totillo, this was Satya's response to the question. He says, quote, yeah, obviously, we're very, very excited about everything that's going on in gaming, especially with the close with the close of the Activision Blizzard King deal. We think that now we have the ability to really do what we've always set out to do, what we have always set out to do, which is build great games and deliver them to folks across all platforms, right? Which is Xbox and consoles the PCs, and now even including mobile gaming and cloud gaming. Okay? That sounds like an echo of what Brad Smith said last month, which is 100%. We want to put video games on Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 5. Uh, pretty much all but saying it directly. Anyway, continuing on, he says, We're excited about the future. We want to do our very best work in gaming. It's, <clears throat> it's a core business for us, but also I see tremendous synergy between what we're doing up and down the AI stack. I always say Microsoft is not a conglomerate. Uh, we have one platform that we express through multiple different addressable markets, and gaming is one. When I think about AI, what we're doing with the infrastructure layer and what we uh, and what we will do at the edge, it's sort of the same transistors that first we were using for graphics. Guess what? Are being able being used for AI. You can connect the dots and see why gaming is going to be more strategic for us. So let's address the first statement about. Okay, that's that's there. Um, 
editorializing of the article. So we're done there. there there's a quote. We can stop there. I must say that, keep in mind, Satya Nadella is saying that gaming is a core pillar for Microsoft. Gaming is like a pet project for Microsoft. But the reason why I think right now it matters so much is, I mean, this week, we're not talking about on the show because it's not really relevant to the show, but Microsoft just surpassed Apple in 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 by having the highest market cap of any company in the world. So it, it's been a long time. It's been like since pre-iPhone, since Microsoft last had a market cap higher than Apple's. And so this is huge news. Right now, Microsoft is the most valuable company in the entire universe, uh, which is massive. And a lot of that is off the heels of not Xbox, despite the fanboys and the, and the console warriors, not Surface, despite me, and certainly not Windows Phone, despite me. Um, this is based on, obviously, Microsoft's just impossibly impossible to... Uh, <laughs> Impossible to detach corporate integration with the entire world, but also AI, also cloud. Also, these are the things like Azure, AI. This is the stuff. Uh, the uh, what do they call it? Microsoft Copilot. This is the stuff that is making Microsoft soar right now. This is right why people are are keen on the business, why people are investing in the business, why people care about what Microsoft's doing is because this is kind of where the world, at least at this very specific moment in time, is headed in, in Xbox, or not Xbox, but Microsoft as a parent company is at the forefront of all of that. And so why does Xbox, the ugly redheaded stepchild of the, of the Microsoft business, matter so much? Well, because you just invested so much fucking money in them. That's f- for sure one reason. But also because... Anytime there is a new technology to be explored, I'm talking about computers in the fucking first place. I'm talking about smartphones. I'm talking about AR. I'm talking about AI, whatever the case may be. Anytime there's a brand new thing, a new technological uh, boundary that has been pushed, a new a new frontier of technology, the first way in which that thing is always explored Video games, always. It's always fucking video games. Why do people buy computers? Because they want to play video games. Why do people buy the iPad touches and iPod touches and iPhones and shit? The app store, you can do the, the game where it's like it looks like you're drinking a beer. That's that's the stuff, man. It's always video games. And so I think right now, as Microsoft's big push forward into into AI uh, goes on and on, they see the obvious, just just simple dot connecting of, uh, of gaming and AI, and they go, well, that's going to be where we can really start to integrate and explore and, uh, and, and improve to the world why our, our, our bet on AI matters so much is because we can explore that and demonstrate that to the world through our gaming division. And so that is why, why a guy like Sachin Nadella, who oftentimes seem, seems to, I mean, I wouldn't know, I, I don't know the guy, but seems to not really know a whole lot about what's going on with the Xbox division and seems to not really give a whole lot of fucks about gaming in general. Um, that might be why a guy like, like Sachin Nadella is suddenly uh, out here saying really, really important things like about Xbox. Like, oh yeah, we, we see it as one of our core pillars and oh, oh we're really excited about AI and gaming. Because, yeah, it, it, gaming pushing AI forward and proving to the world its, its place in the world and why it matters is a huge boon to Microsoft Copilot and everything they're trying to do with AI in general, which will eventually trickle down, as everything does, into the world of business and commerce and whatnot. And that's, uh, that's, that's what it's all about, baby. Everyone bought a Windows computer so they could play some dirty-ass video games. Next thing you know, boom, you're at work typing up emails to Cindy in accounting about why your paycheck was off by $4.75. And that is how Microsoft became the most powerful company in the world. And we lost Windows Phone, and we will never forget. Uh, I mean, that's a huge fucking deal. Let's, uh, now, I don't care about the AI stuff, and that's just the aside. The, the main thing to note here is you got Brad Smith and Satya Nadella, two people who are undoubtedly more important and higher up the company than Phil Spencer. No disrespect, Phil. Uh, and both of them are, I mean, Brad Smith literally said PlayStation and Satya Nadella is saying Xbox and consoles. Motherfucker, he's not talking about Ouya, okay? So if he's talking about bringing games to all platforms and he specifically says Xbox and consoles, I mean, you can hide behind under the sheets and pretend it's not happening all you want. But Microsoft, at least, is very interested in putting video games on PlayStation hardware. And, I, and they're not talking about pre-existing shit like Elder Scrolls Online because no one cares about Elder Scrolls Online. They're not talking about Minecraft and, and things like that. They are talking about 
put in games that you know and love that you tweet about and make weird little fan art about and taking those games and putting them on PlayStation at some point. And uh, you're just going to have to get comfortable with that because they're <laughs> this is happening. I don't know when. I don't know how. We don't know the model yet. You know, last week I suggested they could do a very PlayStation approach to it where PlayStation treats PC as its secondary platform where it's like, hey, here's a new PlayStation exclusive. It's on PS5. Go fuck yourself. This is the only place you can play it. Two years later, they say, all right, all right, PC plebeians. Now you can play our game. Now we will put God of War on our platform. Now we will put Spider-Man on our platform. Once we've milked PS5 users for all we fucking can, now you PC losers can enjoy the scraps of what that game was. And I think Xbox could have a very similar approach with PlayStation if they wanted. All right, Indiana Jones, it's on Xbox. Fuck you, PlayStation. How does it feel to want? Two years later, all right, PlayStation, here. You can have our Indiana Jones game. Uh, it's two years old, and you guys are idiots, and you can spend $70 for it instead of Game Pass, but there you go. There you go. It's it's there if you want it. I I mean, I, I, I know a lot of people look at this, and they say, Xbox is failing. It's like... Yeah, in some sense they are. They really are fucking failing at the hardware market. There's no denying that. Uh, but in another sense, it's like this is kind of an inevitable future for gaming in general. And maybe Xbox folds first and PlayStation and Nintendo get to reign supreme uh, for a very long time afterwards without Xbox hardware existing. But eventually you got to think there's no way that this is Sony's reality forever and always that they are creating gaming hardware and that at some point in time it's not about streaming from a PC and playing on mobile devices and PCs and TVs and other devices that aren't dedicated five, $600 home consoles. As much as I love the home console experience and I will continue to support it as long as it's a viable option for me, that's not always going to be the future. And I think Xbox is probably going to be the first one to fall out, but at the same time, in a way they're kind of accepting the inevitable future before everyone else. I don't know. That's just, that's just one way to look at it. It's not a guarantee just because I, I, I read the tea leaves this way doesn't mean it's it doesn't make it so. So don't get mad at me. Don't shoot the hypothetical messenger. But, I mean, <laughs> you got the CEO and the CFO of the company saying, we want to put video games on PlayStation. What? How, how else do you want me to interpret that, man? And even if they do day and date, even if we get to a point where it's like Halo 7 comes to PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, it's like, well... Cool, on Xbox, you get a better platform to play it in, a better ecosystem to play it in. It's included in your Game Pass subscription. On PlayStation, you can use a you can use the, the, a controller that hurts your hands and the game costs 70 bucks. It's like, okay, well it's not like there's it's not like they come out day and date on equal footing. You know, there's still an advantage to Xbox. Uh, but yeah. Here we go. <laughs> so We'll, we'll talk about this more because I, I this will you know that that was a very I want to get to the the developer co- direct that's the stuff we're here for today but I just want to make it very clear this is an inevitable conversation we will be having for a long time I thought you know the monkey's paw of me saying uh, I will do anything to get past this Microsoft Activision conversation for two years straight the 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 the, the pure the pure hubris in thinking that that was the worst thing we could have to, to, to talk about for two years uh, is about to be nothing compared to this conversation we're about to face for probably quite a while of our Xbox games coming to PlayStation. What does it look like? What does this mean for the future of Xbox hardware? Is Xbox going away forever? Is Xbox going to go the way of Sega? What does this mean? What does this mean? What is it? I don't know, man. Can't answer that right now. But for now, I will say... Xbox games probably come in PlayStation. All right, Stalker 2 has been delayed to late 2024. Don't have a whole lot to say about this. They cite uh, feedback from fans who have played the, um, who have played like uh, alphas and things like that as the reason, but the, the game is now set to release in, on September 5th, 2024. So has a specific release date, September 5th. I think that's reasonable. Still coming out this year, Stalker 2. Not surprised again. This is like the game of all games where if it gets delayed, most people are like, oh, okay, I understand. You know, so Stalker 2 now coming out September 5th, still a Game Pass game, day one, great get for Xbox. And, you know, we can bring this back up when we talk about the developer direct in a little bit. But like we got we got ourselves a beefy little year for Xbox. We got Stalker 2. We got Warhammer. We got Indie. We got Avowed. We got, you know, all the games. We got Hellblade. We got Kill the Justice League. If you're like me and for some reason you're actually looking forward to that, even though. Apparently, the game's not very good, uh, according to early feedback, but that's okay. I don't know, man. 2024, shaping up to be a decent year over on the Xbox platform. All right, uh, moving on. Let's, um, we got, we actually have three more. There, again, there's a lot of these stories, so 
Uh, let's talk about a little bit of Ubisoft because Ubisoft's got some fuckery going on with their uh, subscription service that I actually think makes their offering instantly more compelling. So let's let's get into that real quick. This is from Ubisoft's website explaining uh, this new change that has been made. So it's gonna be a little bit like a Q and A. Um, it's gonna read like a Q and A slash uh, like a wire kind of blog post. So here we go from Ubisoft's website. They announced today alongside the early access launch of Prince of Persia, the Lost Crown, blah, blah, blah. Ubisoft has officially renamed its subscription plans. Ubisoft Plus multi-access and PC access will no, will now become Ubisoft Plus Premium, offering day one new releases and early access where applicable alongside premium editions, monthly rewards and more. Ubisoft is also introducing a new offer, Ubisoft Plus Classic on PC, a curated selection of popular back catalogs and live games. So this is day one. This is this is Ubisoft going full Game Pass. This is day one Ubisoft access to new games. So in the little Q&A, they, they address, I, I picked out a couple questions I thought were pertinent to people who want to know things about games. Um, and these three questions, we'll read the Q&A real quick. Uh, first one was, what are the core differences between Ubisoft Plus Premium and Ubisoft Plus Classic, this, the two tiers? They said, premium means that day one access to new releases, and in some cases, like Prince of Persia, early access to upcoming new releases. This is a top of our extensive back, This sorry, this is on top of our back extensive catalog, which you'll have access to, uh, along with premium editions, DLC, and monthly rewards. All of that is offered on Xbox, PC, and Amazon Luna but it's not offered on PS5 uh, and you'll only need to subscribe once to have access to all these games across all these platforms. Players can subscribe to Ubisoft plus premium for $18 per month. Obviously not as much of a value proposition compared to something like game pass, but you can kind of understand why when Ubisoft is just a software company that is solely, you know, putting all of their products onto this service for one price. You know, it's not, it's kind of a different model than, than Game Pass in a way. Um, they said, alternatively, players can subscribe to Ubisoft Plus Classic, which is just a curated selection of our most popular back catalog games like Far Cry 6, Rainbow Six Siege, Watch Dog Legions. Uh, the catalog will grow over time. It's included in... Uh, it is included for PlayStation Plus Extra and PlayStation Plus Premium members. It is now available on PC through Ubisoft Store for eight dollars per month. So this is like, um, this is like Xbox Game Pass Core versus Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Basically, it's like, hey, here is a list of games that are a couple years old plus our old back catalog for eight bucks a month. You get that, or for eighteen dollars a month, ten bucks more a month, you get access to. All the latest games, the day they come out, in some cases a few days early, you get the premium edition, you get DLC included, you get all that day one stuff. It's the creme of the, the creme of the crop, the cream of the crop, baby. You want that Avatar, you want that new Prince of Persia, you want to play any of those games, day one, here you go, 18 bucks a month. It's a pretty good offering that they, that they the fact that they even have this as an option, I think is really awesome. Um, I mean, ostensibly, you could just subscribe for eight, 18 bucks for one month, play Avatar and 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 uh, what is it, the Crew Horizon or the Crew Festival or whatever it's called, um, and you know do all that for a couple weeks and then get out for eighteen bucks. Not a bad deal. Uh, but they said, what about? Oh, but they they address that very uh, that very notion in this next Q and A question where they say, well, what about day one releases and how do you co combat people who just cancel and unsubscribe as they see fit? To which they said, the goal of Ubisoft Plus for us is to build value. We've made a commitment to bring more games to more subscribers. So looking into the future, we have an exciting lineup that they'll be able to play either in early access or on day one. And that will eventually have Activision Blizzard games on it as well. Because remember, Activision Blizzard streaming rights go to Ubisoft as part of Microsoft's capitulation to the CMA over in Europe. So Ubisoft Plus is going to be a place to play Activision Blizzard games at some point in time. Alongside the perks... And our rich, diverse back catalog, we believe that offering compelling reason for a place to stick around. So what they're basically saying here is, we don't have a way to penalize you. It's like Netflix. Netflix, you can subscribe to Netflix for one month, watch 100 movies, unsubscribe, and be like, I got like so much value out of Netflix for one month, and I'll subscribe like in two years when I want to come back for another month. You could do that if you want. There's no way to stop you. Um, so they don't have like one of those penalties where it's like, oh, you cancel your subscription? Okay, we're not going to let you sign up again for another six months as a way of, you know, trying to deter people from doing that, sign up for a month, play a bunch of games, bounce, come back a year later, come back eight months later, whatever, and then play a bunch of games for one month, cancel a subscription, 
So they're saying is, we don't have a way around that, but what we will do is continue to add value to the service so people don't feel compelled to do that. Well, guess what, newsflash? People are going to do that no matter what. In fact, I'm very interested in spending $18 for one month of this so I can play the new Avatar game and the new Crew game because I'm mildly curious about that, and then bouncing because, to me, that's worth 18 bucks, <laughs> especially when you consider the fact that that new Avatar game is, like, I think on sale at most. It's been, like, 55 bucks. so seems like a pretty compelling value in my opinion, but... Uh, last thing they said, the last little Q&A portion here is, what can you tell us about Activision Blizzard games coming to the service? To which they said, we know players are excited about that, uh, but we are working on different offerings and we'll have more to talk about later. So whatever, kind of nonsense. But the point is, this is 18 bucks, not bad. Eventually at some point, you're going to have all the latest Ubisoft games. So you can imagine, let's say fall 2026. Let's say there's a new Assassin's Creed that comes out that fall. Let's say there's a new Far Cry game that comes out that fall. Let's say there's a new Division game that comes out that in that year or a Ghost Recon game or whatever. And then whatever the latest Call of Duty game is. I mean, you could subscribe to this shit and play the latest COD, the latest uh, the latest um, um, Far Cry, the latest uh, Division, whatever. All that came out in that year, right? 18 bucks a month. That's That's not a bad deal at all. But what I'm really curious to see is... How does this work between Game Pass and Ubisoft Plus with the Activision sh- stuff? That is that is what has me a little bit like, mm, is there going to be some fuckery where it's like some Activision games are only available uh, through subscription if you have uh, if you have this Plus thing? There's no way. I mean, that would defeat so much of the reasoning for Xbox buying Activision in the first place. So I guess maybe just for streaming, will it be something like, oh, this Call of Duty game is available on Game Pass and Ubisoft Plus, but if you want to stream it from the cloud, you got to have Ubisoft Plus. Otherwise, on Xbox, you only have the option to download and play the game natively like that. Like, is that is that going to be a thing that happens? And this is a question I'm a little weary about that I would like to see addressed sooner rather than later because I know most of us are eagerly anticipating a shit ton of Activision Blizzard games coming on the Game Pass pretty soon in the near future sometime this year right maybe by the summertime uh but now we're getting this news and it's like all right that's cool ubisoft you got your own thing maybe sometimes that will be of value but like i want that activision shit on game pass not ubisoft plus so where where are we at with this so that that is the big question to answer um and then two more quick stories to get into before we get into the developer direct uh let's talk about raven software speaking of call of duty speaking of Call of Duty's greatest developers, Raven Software, from VGC, were once reportedly working on a live-service Call of Duty Zombies game, according to a former lead designer at the studio. As reported by MP First, Michael Gumlet, 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 fuck off, who worked at Raven for 23 years and was a project lead and lead designer of Call of Duty between 2010 and 2021, he posted information about a canceled game on his LinkedIn page, and according to him, back in November 2011 to June of 2020, 2012, he was lead designer on an unreleased Call of Duty live service zombies game. That is crazy, because that is during the heyday of Call of Duty. We're talking about MW3 to Black Ops 2 time period. Uh, he describes his role on the project, saying, quote, lead designer on ambitious new Call of Duty zombies live service project, canceled when the Activision studio that owned the part of Call of Duty IP wanted it back. It's probably Treyarch in that case. He also lists more recently canceled projects claiming that between June of 2019 and March 2020, he was a lead designer on an unreleased sequel to a classic Raven IP, which people assume is probably like Hexen or something like that. But but yeah, this is uh this is that kind of shit, man. First of all, the can't the unreleased sequel the blah, 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 to a classic Raven IP, that's that kind of shit where Xbox's ownership will change things because whether it's them or someone else, I think Phil Phil Spencer and in Xbox in general, maybe that hopefully that trickles down to Matt Booty, who controls the stuff a little more deliberately. We'll have more free reign to be able to be like, mm, we really have a desire and a hankering to make this kind of game. And then Xbox will be like, oh, hi, so this nay. And then they'll be like, oh, go, 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 go make that game. And uh, I feel like things like that getting canceled, like a, like a potential Hexen remake or reboot or sequel, um, have much more of a, a chance to live and breathe under Xbox's ownership than they did under uh, Bobby Codex uh, tyranny. So that's not to say that's for sure the, the case, but I do have a, a suspicion that that's more likely now. I don't know. I just had to read this because Call of Duty Zombies, the best part of Call of Duty, a, a standalone live service product, especially in the early 2010s. That sounds 
Kind of crazy. I really wonder what that would have been. I mean, this is what people have asked for forever and ever and ever, which is bundle all the Call of Duty Zombies maps into one product, sell it separately, make it a standalone product. I mean, nowadays, I think the way most fans envision this or, or desire this product is for it to be called Call of Duty Zombies Chronicle. You download it independently like you would Warzone, and it's like one free map. It's like modern Call of Duty Zombies. You get a single map, and it's free to play. And then if you want to play any other map, you just pay for them. You download them, right? It's DLC, and they put every Call of Duty Zombies map ever made in it, or at least all the good the good ones, the Treyarch ones. You know, all the ones from World at War, Black Ops 1, 2, 3, 4, Cold War. You take all these maps, you put them on one platform. It's a live service Call of Duty Zombies game, and it's got all the traditional zombies. And then on top of that, you can add new types of zombies mode, like a zombie outbreak or a zombie battle royale, whatever the fuck you want to do. And you basically build yourself a Call of Duty Zombies games as a service, much like how you have Warzone. And I love this idea. Fans have been clamoring for this for years and years and years. I I never had any doubt that this is something that someone somewhere <laughs> within the Call of Duty umbrella has wanted to do or kicked around. I just always assumed it was Treyarch and not Raven. But to know that Raven was working on at least some zombies-related project, live service project, kind of hurts because I would so much rather have Raven, arguably the best developer uh, at, on, on, on the Call of Duty franchise, you know, aside from maybe Treyarch, um, I would just so much rather them be working on zombies and doing something cool with that than be stuck on Warzone bitch duty, which is what they, they actually do. Um, cause man, I'm sorry. If you, if you love Warzone, more power to you, but Warzone is such a fucking cancer on the Call of Duty franchise. It's, it's, it's totally cool to like Warzone. I've, I've enjoyed Warzone. I think Warzone 2 is actually... I've enjoyed Warzone 2 better than Warzone 1. Um, and It had some decent games uh, during Modern Warfare 2's year, uh, last year. And that's fine. But the way Warzone has just fucking trickled into every crevice of this franchise and just... Man, Call of Duty is significantly worse off as a franchise as a result of Warzone's existence. And imagine a world where Raven was working on zombies shit instead. I mean, wouldn't that just be so much more fun? I understand you wouldn't get your sweaty streamers and they wouldn't be like, what's up, everybody? Today's video is sponsored by G Fuel and we're going to be sh getting number one on Battle Royale today. That's fine. But can you imagine a world where it was like, guys zombies with your buddies it's fun remember when video games were fun it's arcadey you run around you have fun sometimes you win sometimes you lose but at the end of the day you're gonna have a good time and that would be awesome it would be zombies and it would be badass and there'd be ray guns and there'd be cool aesthetics and it'd be like halloween all the time it'd be fucking creepy and cool and there'd be zombies and they go ah and you would shoot them and they would die because they were zombies but they wouldn't actually die because they're zombies and i would just Really enjoy that. So, developer direct coming up very shortly, guys. We got one more mildly amusing story. I don't know what to tell you. All the news. They, 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 this is how they do it. Those bastards at Xbox. Those those Sachi Nadellas. This is what they do. They hold all the stories. They put them in their pocket. And they dump them all on one on one week. This is how they do it. They, those bastards. Last one from VGC. Rocksteady is getting ready to release their brand new Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League game, but before. This game was what we know it to be today. At one point, it was reportedly being developed as a completely different original multiplayer game prior to its Suicide Squad association. That's according to a Bloomberg article which covers how Warner Bros. own studio uh, came to work on the upcoming DC supervillain game. Citing sources and said it to be familiar with the UK studio's strategy over the last decade, they claimed that the release of Batman Arkham Knight back in 2015 rocks with that Rocksteady began working on a Batman Arkham VR game, which did previously come out, as well as a previously unreported multiplayer game based on an original franchise, not Batman, not DC. Batman Arkham Origins and Gotham Knights studio Warner Bros. Montreal reportedly had a Suicide Squad game canceled at the end of 2016, and then proper uh, and then the property was later offered to Rocksteady, uh, which started working on the Kill the Justice League game the following year. That would be 2017 for those who need a little bit of a refresher on calendars. Uh, no further details were offered about the shelved original multiplayer game. Contrary to reports, Bloomberg has also claimed that Rocksteady never pitched or worked on the Superman game that many believed to be in the works for years before Suicide Squad got the uh, got the announcement, the, 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 the green light. Um, this is actually really interesting because it has widely been accepted 
as a fact at this point for, for, for a long time that Rocksteady was working on a Superman game. They're like, okay, now we're going to do, we did Batman. Now we're going to do Superman. And that was a, a rumor for a very long time. And then when Suicide Squad got kind of rumored, murmured, leaked, announced, whatever, um, the conversation about that Superman game shifted to, it's just hard to do a Superman game. You're invincible. You can fly. It's kind of hard to find a fun gameplay loop. How do you do it? And so eventually they moved on and that's how we got to Suicide Squad. And that's kind of always been the conventional wisdom about how we made it from Gotham or Arkham Knight in 2015 to where we are today. And finding out that this happened all in between is actually surprising. Um, It's crazy because the way they word it is they say um, Rocksteady was offered the Suicide Suicide Squad game. So I wonder if they were working on an original multiplayer game where you run around, you jump, and you shoot things, and it's got fun traversal, and it's guns, 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 and violence. And then they're like, hey, do you, do you guys want to do this Suicide Squad game? And then they were like, mm. And then Warner Bros. was like, you should do the Suicide Squad game. They're like, okay. And then that got like kind of reskinned on their multiplayer game, and that's how whatever their original multiplayer game became Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. I, I, I almost wonder if that is what happened here because the overwhelming response from, from the people that have played kill the justice league with these early previews has been like, this game is not bad. In fact, the storytelling in the world building are pretty badass, and the gameplay loop is fine, but the overwhelming point of contention people have with the game seems to be what about this game is the suicide squad. Why are the suicide squad jumping around, swinging from buildings, holding heavy guns, trying to shoot Superman in the face. Like this is, this doesn't make sense. That seems to be like, I watched a really good skill up video kind of going over this where he's like, I like the game. I love the story content so far. I just don't understand why, you know, like boomerang and, and Harley Quinn are out here running around shooting Superman with, with guns. Like this doesn't, this isn't how it would happen. This isn't, this doesn't make sense. Like what is this game? It's like the wrong game attached to the wrong IP, but that doesn't mean the story is bad. And that doesn't mean the gameplay is not fun. It just means it doesn't make sense. And, I can see that, and if you you, you can kind of deduct from this story if all this reporting is accurate, and you know usually these sources are pretty good, Bloomberg and all, you could see how maybe Suicide Squad was a different, new original IP multiplayer title that got a Suicide Squad skin slapped on it at some point halfway through development, and that would also kind of explain why the game kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed, and why we all keep scratching our heads going, why the fuck did it take you guys like? nine years to make a game after Batman Arkham Knight uh, just for it to be, you know, this of all things. Like, it's not, you know, no no, no offense to Suicide Squad. It's just it doesn't look like a game that takes nine years to make. And uh, I feel like this, this kind of explains everything, but I would like to know what, where did the rumor about Superman come from? Was that just like a, a wish willed into existence by fans or is that an actual conversation or was there just a game of telephone that was played at some point? Like I would like to know where that plays into things because that Superman game was largely considered to be truth for, for many years. So it's kind of crazy that we're just finding out after all these years and all these reports and all these leaks and rumors that no, we were just wrong all this time. This is how it actually went down. It's like, that's weird. Like I, someone would have known for at some point, especially someone at Bloomberg or something like that. Like this isn't, it doesn't all add up. But it makes sense. Like the the way we're getting the knowledge and, and how long it took for us to get here doesn't make sense. But the pieces seem to fit into place when you understand what we're getting at Suicide Squad, how long it took to get it, what they were allegedly working on beforehand and, and how they got here. Like that that makes sense. <laughs> so I don't know, whatever. Um, I'm still excited to play this game. I get it. In a lot of ways, it doesn't make sense. I'm excited for the characters. I'm excited for the story. I think the premise of the Suicide Squad being tasked with the impossible, the impossible um, quest of killing the Justice League is super fun, super ridiculous, and I like stupid, shooty, shooty, dumb, mindless games. And so if I if I can feel like I can swing around and jump around and shoot and blast my way out of you know aliens' faces while I listen to podcasts and watch a couple cool cutscenes where Batman dies or something like that, I mean I'm I, I, I feel like that's 70 bucks well spent, but I don't know. There's a part of me that's saying, give it two or three months. This game will be $40. Please do not buy it on day one. But I don't know, man. I, I, I still am optimistic about the game. I still think it looks good. And uh, yeah, I, I, unfortunate for Rocksteady, a, a team that is so beloved, clearly fallen from grace. 
uh, with this. And there's no no wonder why their founders left. But we'll, we'll talk about them at the end of the podcast. They're part of the dessert section of the uh, show. Guys, that's it for all of our smaller news stories, mildly amusing stories. Again, if you're, if you're like tapping your toes waiting for us to talk about the Xbox developer uh, direct. I mean, I told you there were timestamps. Just go listen to that, then come back around, okay? We don't have to, we don't have to get all antsy. All right, that's it for the new opening news. Let's uh, jump into the main news. But before we do that, we always take a moment to discuss the games we've been playing this week. What games have you been playing, Jesse? Well, it's a good thing we just talked about Batman Arkham because it's uh, really timely. I've been playing Batman Arkham. But before I can tell you about what I've been playing and why I've been playing it and how it's been, I must first inform you of what I've been eating. It is so critical that you guys know. Guys, I've got some good news, bad news. I am back on the health grind. Gasp. I know. You know, in 2021, I did really good. I don't know what sparked that that year. Cronky one th- one day told me, oh, I'm calorie counting. I'm like, I'm going to give that a try. And then I just, you know, it's like you always go through phase. Oh, I'm going to learn how to play the piano or like, ooh, I'm going to write a book this year. Or like, I'm going to. I'm going to become a, a horticulture expert or some shit like that. Like we have these lofty ideas for ourselves. And then like you give up after like two to five days of enthusiasm, of enthusiasm for that, for that, that thing. For some reason in 2021, I just randomly had a knee jerk. Like I'm going to count my calories and try to lose weight and be healthy. And I did it. I lost like almost 15 pounds. I uh, got, you know, I'm not, I'm not like so overweight. I didn't need to lose like 50, 70 pounds or something like I need to lose like 20 pounds. I lost a lot of the weight. Started counting my calories, thinking a little more about what I was eating, making healthier eating choices. It was good. It was I built some healthier habits. I, I I developed a healthier relationship with food in 2021. It was good. It was awesome. And then 2022, I discovered my love of cruising, and then I immediately gave it up. I gained most of that weight back, uh, and I just stopped giving a fuck. Although I don't, I never got as bad as I was before I started. So that's the good thing. But a couple of weeks ago, I was like. No, we're not. We're not playing this game. I'm not going to do the up and down thing. Life doesn't have to be a roller coaster in this regard. We're, we're, we're staying on the train. So after 2022 and 2023 being more or less, a, I don't give a fuck with the with the the diet, especially these last few months with the holidays and everything. The move just being especially like seven slices of pizza and a Big Mac every every other day. Um, we're getting back on the train. We're doing it again. So. I already lost a little bit of the water weight. I've been doing the calories for about two weeks now. I'm feeling better. My blood pressure's normalizing a little bit. I got to be careful because I, I'm prone to high blood pressure. Got it. Got to make sure through diet and exercise, I'm keeping that shit in check. I don't want to be on medication if I don't have to be. So I'm feeling good. Things are getting back in check. Numbers are normalizing a little bit, and I'm feeling a little better, a little more energetic. I'm taking some some B. 12 some no b complex vitamins i'm taking some new vitamins okay so it's it's good it's not exciting to talk about you know it's not like cheeseburgers uh, or anything like that but it feels good to be on the right track and the reason i want to bring this up is because i i, I will say because I, I i hate the idea of like oh you have to be healthy you could never have cheeseburgers again like that's dumb and stupid at the exact same time but what i do love about like getting healthy is it's like If you do it at least the way I do it, where it's mostly about calorie counting and then just trying to keep the sodium level in check, keep the cholesterol in check, maybe avoid bad fats and and, and think about like healthier carbs and stuff like that. You know, just try to be a little more mindful of it. The thing is, after a while, you get so used to like what it is you're looking out for and what kind of calorie content you might find in certain items that you get to a point where you're not constantly like looking it up and trying to track your calories and figure things out. And you just kind of have a general feel for how things are. And after like doing this so strictly throughout 2021, I I do feel like I have the ability to walk into a grocery store and make healthy purchasing decisions and then plan meals and and, and food around like, not like, let me pull out a calculator and count all my calories individually, but like to be able to be like, yeah, this meal is around this many calories, gotta be mindful of that, pairing this item with this item because I don't, you know, that's a little high in, in carbs, I don't need two carbs or like that's too much sodium, I don't need that right now. And just trying to like, balance and manage things it becomes second nature and less of a chore over time and what i really enjoy is now that i'm at a point where controlling these things and being mindful of these things is more is more innate and less uh and less of like a like a laborious task i kind of enjoy my my cheat days and in in the indulgent moments more because it's like yeah if, if i can keep under you know trying to keep around 1900 calories or less a day if i can do that every day uh, you know, throughout Monday through Friday, you know, avoid avoid going overboard on the calories, avoid eating takeout or whatever. Then on Saturday, 
all bets are off. On Saturday, you can have a fucking free-for-all. You can do whatever the hell you want. And it's so, it, you enjoy it so much more when it's like that. Not just because, you know, it's, it's good to miss a thing or like, you know, everything's enjoyed better in moderation or that kind of thing. Not just because of that, which is, of course, part of it. But you enjoy your food more because there's, um, there's like a better appreciation for it. There's something so mindless about like, I'm going to order a pizza and just not even think about it and eat the whole goddamn pizza by myself in one sitting. Like that's, that's great. Don't get me wrong. That's an amazing, beautiful thing that can happen sometimes, but there's something really special about like looking forward to that pizza and then choosing how you want to eat your pizza based on like what you've eaten that day so far or the day before or what you plan on having tomorrow and being like, yeah, maybe I'll try these toppings instead of those toppings. Maybe I'll try this crust style instead of that crust style. Maybe, oh, but if I do, you know, if I get thin crust, I can have more slices of pizza. But if I get regular crust, I can enjoy this one. And it, it, you like, you just start to think about food in a more dynamic way. And I feel like it opens you up to trying more things, being more thoughtful about specifically what it is you're eating. And then, of course, getting to indulge when it's time to cheat and indulge. And I love that. So it's so fun. So like I'm back on it and I'm thinking about like I've been really good this week. And I'm thinking about Saturday. I'm like might be time to bring a little TGI Fridays back into my life, you know? Um, you know, think about Sunday, little, little Tampa Bay Buccaneers and some Buffalo Wild Wings. Just saying, Andrew, if you're listening, maybe Buffalo Wild Wings, what do you think? And it's just, uh, it's just, it's just fun. So I'm enjoying it. And, uh, shout, shout out to, shout out to being healthy. It's not, I don't know. I don't mean to be like vain and obnoxious, but it's like, a. I just feel like, it can be it can be fun and rewarding, and I feel like that that that's that's the thing I like. It's like that feeling you get when like you finish watching a TV show or you read a book or like you do you know you you feel good about yourself when it's like I'm I'm kind of in control of the thing. I know what's happening, and and the more and more you get to learn it, the the more natural and second nature it becomes. And I'm I'm just uh, I feel good getting back on the horse in that sense. But uh, that's it for what I've been eating. It's not it's not. We, I don't need to waste your time with that. It has nothing to do with uh you know like as a side note, Taco Bell just overhauled their value menu. Haven't tried it yet, but something to keep in mind. Maybe that happens this weekend. I don't fucking know. Options are open. All right, let's let's stop talking. About it. Food's dumb. Food's for babies. And now we're gonna. Talk, that's literally a fact. Food is for babies, not exclusively, but food is for babies. Let's talk about what I've been playing, guys. I finished Batman: Arkham City this past week. So Batman: Arkham Asylum done. Batman: Arkham City done. Up next, I wanted to do Batman: Arkham origins but i'm gonna go straight to batman arkham knight because arkham origins was on sale on steam for like six bucks like a couple weeks ago and my dumbass i thought i bought it but i didn't and now it's back up to like 20 dollars on steam so i'm like no i will wait 75 seconds for it to go back on sale all joking aside it will go back on sale and you know soon so i thought you know what will be fun because arkham origins is like such a quote-unquote christmas game anyway I'll just wait. I'll wait till Christmas 2024. It'll be like a really fun little treat because I'm enjoying these Batman Arkham games so much that it'd be nice to have one to like look forward to in the future. So what I'm going to do is jump ahead to Ar- Arkham uh, Arkham Knight because I bought the trilogy like a year ago. I already own one, two, and three. So I'm just going to go ahead, play Arkham Knight because I already have it. I don't have to spend money on it. It's already there. I'm just going to enjoy it and then be, be all caught up and done with it. I'll be ready to play Suicide Squad next month. And that's it. I'll be done with the DC Batman games for a while. I don't have to think about these for a while. I can move on to other games. And then my plan is around Christmas time this year, maybe around December or something, I'll download Batman Arkham Origins on a Steam sale and I'll play through that game. And it'll be like my Christmas game this year because, you know, it's snowy. It takes place during Christmas time. And it'll be nice to be like, oh, I really enjoy those Batman Arkham games. It's nice that there is this like spinoff title that's like waiting there for me the next time I'm in the mood, but I go, oh man, I already played those games. I wish I could, you know, I wish I could experience them again. It's like, cool. So I think this, this works. It wasn't my original plan, but I think it works. I'm making lemonade out of the lemons that are uh, steam, not having this game on sale right now. So that is the plan, but that doesn't explain how Arkham city was now that I rolled credits on it. Okay. So how was it? It's good. It's really good. Um, I Batman Arkham city was not exactly what I expected it to be. And, and, and I'm kind of torn on it. I feel like I enjoyed Batman Arkham City more than Asylum in terms of its moment-to-moment gameplay. I just thought it was more fun because I I guess it scratched that part of my brain that uh, Gotham Knights scratched when I played that last year. Where it's like, you know, it's like 
dumb swinging around the world, play a podcast in the background while you play through Batman. But then when it was story driven, when it was cinematic and, and narrative stuff was happening, I was like really invested and it was really good. Um, the combat feels like a big step up from Arkham Asylums. I like the combat a lot more, more gadgets to play with. The, the, the combat just feels a little more connected, a little more visceral, a little more like feed, you get a little more feedback with your punches and stuff. So uh, like combat's a little better. I like the open world approach to it. Story's really good. That being said, I still think Arkham Asylum is a little bit better of a game in general because there's something about the nature of Arkham Asylum where it just feels like the absolute perfect Batman game. It is like the perfect idea for a story, the perfect idea for the gameplay loop, the perfect idea for like the, the, the whole synopsis, this whole like one night at Arkham Asylum, all hell breaks loose. You're stuck on this little prison island and it is your job to get the genie back into the bottle, like deal with all the shit and you get, you get a little appearance from all the bad guys and it's really, really well done. I just feel like that is such a tight, well envisioned, perfectly executed idea of what a Batman game can and, and should be. And so props to Arkham Asylum because I, I just I really think that is like the poster child for what a Batman game should be. But Arkham City even though it has a little bit more of like an open-ended feel because that's how open world games are, where it just feels a little more sloppy. Some bad guys are relegated to side quests. You can skip a lot of side quests and feel like you missed a lot of the game, or you can get really distracted from what's happening currently in the main narrative by investing too much time in the side quests. And therefore, when you get back to the main quest, you feel a little out of place because you're so off track. Something I kind of love, hate about open world games. And this game falls victim to those 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 trappings in the same way any open world game would it's just a side effect of of the genre but i just have a lot of fun playing it playing batman in this format i have a lot of fun with the arkham games in this format and so arkham city more fun than arkham asylum arkham asylum a better representation and envision of like envisioning of what a batman game could be i don't i don't know if that makes sense but i'm kind of of two minds of it it doesn't matter both games were great I liked Arkham City a lot. I liked Arkham Asylum a lot. And I'm really looking forward to Arkham Knight. I'm excited to try out the Batmobile. I remember it being a hot button topic in 2015 when the game came out where people were like, there's just too much, too much Batmobile. You spend too much time in the Batmobile. I'm ready to experience it to figure out for myself if that's how I feel, to figure out what all the fuss was about. But I know people love it. I know the story is apparently great. And uh, I have, listen, they, they, they've won me over. Rocksteady. You British, you British bastards, you have won me over. You are a wonderful developer. You are very capable. Definitely the perfect shepherds of this IP. And uh, yeah, I, I understand the love and respect that this team gets and is very well deserved. These games hold up immaculately. I just, I, like, I, it was, I, I was at the very end of Arkham City and I stopped and thought for a second. I was like, these are, these are Xbox 360 games I'm playing. I didn't even think about that for like a single time until the very end. I was like, damn, these games hold up. I mean, obviously I'm playing the Return to Arkham, like up you know, spruced up versions of the games, I suppose. And yeah, the, 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 the frame rates are a little rough at some part, some parts of some of the games, but that's, that doesn't really matter. In the grand scheme of things, like these games hold up very well. The gameplay is really compelling. The, the, the storytelling, the presentation, everything just really, really great games. So Really big fan of this. Looking forward to getting into Arkham Knight. And then we'll talk about that game, I guess, a little bit next week. And I, I'm sorry if you don't like these Batman Arkham games. It's just I'm on a kick right now. This is what I'm playing. So this is like all there is for me to talk about. So that's it for what I've been playing. With that said, we take a take a little uh, water break. Get into this Xbox Developer Direct. I'm ready for it. Let's, let's fucking do it. All right, let's jump right into the developer direct. So, I figure we'll just go in the order in which everything was revealed. There's only five items to talk about, but I assume at least two of these we're going to talk about in great detail. So, we always find a way to make it drag out, for better or for worse. Starting off to just kind of set the tone, here's a, here's a comment from Kronky. He wrote in and says, Here's my developer direct takeaway. Avowed. I think they did a bad job presenting this game, but I know it's going to be a 10 out of 10 regardless. Super excited. Hellblade. They said it's shorter, so I guess it's more true of a walking sim. Seems like a misuse of first-party resources. Mana. Perfect. So glad for a chance for bathroom break. Ha ha ha. Ara. This game looks better every time I see it. Wow, super excited. Can't believe they haven't announced it on Xbox yet. And lastly, Indiana Jones. I had super low hopes, but wow, what a reveal. It looks incredible. I'm so pumped for this. Kronky, I agree and disagree so much with some of what you said. 
I think you nailed <laughs> my opinions on Avowed. Kind of mirrored some of my feelings on Indiana Jones. Don't care about Aura, don't care about Mana, Hellblade. Maybe I'm a little more optimistic this time on Hellblade. I don't know. I'm, I feel like let's talk about overall impressions before we jump into each game individually. Overall, I really love this developer direct kind of thing they're doing. This is now the second year in a row they've done it. They did it last January. Now they did this January. I hope we continue to see this be a trend where every January they do this. I love it on so many levels. I think one, it's really cool that they do it in January. January is typically kind of a slower month. Obviously, we're just coming off the high of you know, the busiest time of the previous year where all the biggest games are coming out around the fall time. And then the game awards happens, then it's Christmas, then New Year's and all these sales and people have time off and they're catching up on all the great games of the, of the previous year. And then boom, January hits and it's like, boom, what do we do now? <laughs> and so I love that about the developer direct because it's like, it comes out just at a time where it's like, it seems like everything's slowed down. There's nothing to really think about or talk about or look forward to. So it kind of sets the stage and gets a lot of attention. I also love that it's at the beginning of the year because it's Xbox's way of saying, hey, new year, here's exactly what you should be expecting from us this year. It's like at the very top, they take the stage, they set the stage, they tell you exactly what it is that you should be looking forward to this year from Xbox. And that's especially what I love about it is it's not this game of like, mm, come June, you may or may not find out some of the games you're going to be playing this year, maybe next year, maybe in the future. It's it's very much like if we have the confidence to put a game in this presentation, it means that we think you will be playing it this year. And that's really cool, um, especially because I think this is kind of the perfect way for a company that has unfortunately earned this this mantra or this 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 association of like where the games this is a really great way for them to combat that narrative by saying, hey, we're the ones that come out first thing every year and say, this is this. these are the games. This is why Xbox this year. Because Nintendo doesn't do that. You know, Nintendo does a direct whenever the fuck they feel like it. And PlayStation at this point, PlayStation just doesn't talk about games. And that's not a slight against PlayStation. PlayStation, that's not an Xbox is better thing. That is just a, I don't know what's going on at PlayStation, but they just don't fucking talk. They just, they, they just, I mean, I guess they don't need to. They could literally just shit bricks and they'd still outsell Xbox three to one. So I don't blame them for not talking, but it kind of sucks if you're like a PlayStation only player because right now I don't know what you're looking forward to because they don't talk about their video games anymore. Uh, but I love I love this developer direct format. It's so cool that they just come out right at the top of the year and they go, here's here's what this year has in store for you. All right. Now that with that positivity out, you know, out there up in front, front center, I will say there is a drawback to this, which is that there is no way that these developer directs can t can reach a level of hype similar to like an E3 style presentation or like what they do with their summer showcase, because those events are all about the bam, 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 announcement, trailer, announcement, trailer, announcement, trailer. And I love it. It's so exciting because you're, you know, even when they show a game that you're not into, it's like, you know, you're only like a minute or two away from the next reveal. And maybe that's something you are interested in. When you have these developer directs, it's like, all right, in the case of me, right? I don't care about Aura Untold Stories. It doesn't mean it's a bad game. Doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean it's not for someone else. It just means personally, this is not the kind of game I care about. So when they start talking about this for 10, 12, 15 minutes straight, I'm like, oh God, I'm just waiting for Indiana Jones. And so that is one thing I don't like as much about this is that when it's a game you care about, it's a pretty great presentation. When it's a game you don't care about, it's a pretty rough thing to get through. And so it does make the watchability of these slightly more challenging in that way. But I, I, I like the idea of like, hey, developers, you have the stage. You talk about your games. You show it the way you want to show it. Talk about the game the, the way you want to talk about it. And that's really cool. Putting the messaging in the developer's hands. Not doing the old school E3 thing of being like, we need a vertical slice that is uh, really polished and is going to take a bunch of time out of your, you know, whatever. It's it's respectful of the developer's time. It gives them a platform to to, to present their, pro their project to the world. And I just think it's a really cool way to do this. So overall, while it does have some drawbacks, I really love the style of, uh, of, of uh, directs. And I, I hope we continue to see Xbox do this because I think it's a winning formula. I think it's really cool because Nintendo had, you know, they Nintendo started everything with the Nintendo directs back in the early 2010s, mid 2010s, early 2010s. And then it took a long time, but finally PlayStation caught on. They started doing it. And, um, it felt like Xbox was really bandwagoning by, you know, eventually doing their own digital thing. But by, by doing this, coming up with a developer direct, it took a couple iterations of some different kinds of presentations to get here. But I feel like they found a really unique and interesting way for them to message and market their content to their player base. Um, and I just, I really like what they've come up with here. So there's my praise for the format of the event itself. Now, with that said, this year, 
it's kind of a mixed bag because I walked in this event going, I know I care about Avowed. I know I'm excited to see Indiana Jones. I know I'm going to play Hellblade, but I'm not necessarily excited about it. I'm just, it's like an inevitable obligatory thing. And then Ara, I couldn't, I couldn't care less. So <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of how I felt walking into this. And I feel like in some ways, like 50% of what I thought was reaffirmed. And then 50% of what I thought was kind of like, oh, what a pleasant surprise. So uh, maybe more like 75, 25, but anyway, Let's start off with the first game that was mentioned, which is Obsidian's Avowed. I'm so excited for this game. This is, you know, going into this event, this was already my most anticipated game of 2024. And coming out of this event, I can confidently say this is still my most anticipated game of 2024. The thing I love about Avowed is it feels so authentically Xbox 360 in the best way possible. Not like this looks like a game that could have run on the Xbox 360. That's not what I'm talking about. It looks like this game encapsulates the spirit of what made the Xbox 360 generation so great. It is gameplay first. It is open world. It is a crazy open adventure that, that takes something a little more nerdy, a little more historically kind of like uh, niche and makes it more mainstream and approachable and digestible in, in the form of taking something like pillars of eternity and making it this big Skyrim style open world single player action RPG adventure and it has a beautiful art style. It's an original IP. Um, it looks compelling. It takes a formula we're kind of familiar with from games like outer worlds and elder scrolls and fallout and games like in games like that. And then kind of gives it some new flair and some new uh, breath with some of its new mechanics and things it's trying to do. And I don't know. It's like, it feels like it's just a way I feel when I watch gameplay of about every time they've shown it. It feels like a natural evolution of the great games we were given in the Xbox 360 generation. And maybe it's just because that era is especially nostalgic for me just based on my age. But I have such a soft spot for that era of gaming because I feel like when you move into the Xbox One generation and beyond, even though games were objectively phenomenal last generation and are objectively phenomenal today, we get great games all the time. We get the best games we've ever had to this day. You know, like it's not like I'm saying we don't get good games anymore. There's just something about that Xbox 360 generation. When I think about games like Bioshock, Gears of War, Halo, Mass Effect, even though I'm kind of a hypocrite because I haven't played enough Mass Effect to really say this, but I know it's true. I know it's one of those games, Skyrim, Fallout, where it's these games where it perfectly balances good storytelling, great world building, really immersive experiences with it's a video game. Have fucking fun with it. And I feel like the further we get away from the Xbox 360 generation, the further that perfectly balanced, uh, that perfectly balanced equation keeps disproportionately tipping further and further into this like oh it's a video game let's take it too seriously oh it's a video game let's try to be really grim and dark with it oh it's a video game let's try to be really realistic with it oh it's a video game let's try to be really complex with with certain mechanics and aspects of it it's like i don't mean any disrespect to the kinds of first party games sony makes i don't mean to be disrespectful to really beloved popular games like what from software does with their games but i just feel like one one disconnect i have with a lot of modern gaming is like games are too serious they're too they're, they're too, like, dark and grim. They're too, like, oh, you got to parry and master the mechanics, and it's gruelingly tough but fair. And it's like, those things are great. And, I mean, if you listen to, like, early early days of Xbox On, you can tell that I used to be a lot more in that camp of, like, yeah, I want games to be super compelling and, and have these, these somber stories and to be super high art and stuff. It's like, I, I do want games to do that as well. You know, like, I, I praised Alan Wake 2 for being that kind of game last year. But the more I kind of balance out and, and, and kind of mature into my more adult feelings and sentiments towards video games, the more I really crave more than anything games that are really immersive, really unique, really fun, have great storytelling, have great world building, but above all else are like, I'm a fucking video game and I know it come play me and have fun. And that's a lot of tangent because that's what I do. Uh, but every time I see avowed, I don't know how to put it into words other than giving you that that verbose preamble. But every time I see Avowed, immediately that feeling is captured. I'm like, that's Fable 2. That's Gears of War. That's Bioshock. That's uh, Fallout 3. Like, I just, I feel that with Avowed. Not in saying, oh, the gameplay is just like Gears of War 2. No, I'm not fucking stupid. It's, well, I am stupid, but not for that reason. It's, it's that 
It just captures the spirit of that generation. It's not, oh, let's give Avowed a child and put him on a grueling ta- uh, quest line that's going to make you feel like shit by the, end of the, by the end of the game. It's like, no, let's build a really immersive, compelling world that's really fun to explore and, and exist in and, and, and interact with, but... Let's also let you dual wield fucking pistols and have magic first person shooting and have loadouts in a in a Skyrim like game and 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 have like a kind of a little spin on on these kinds of like um Western RPG games. Let's let's put like a little bit of an artistic flair on it and give it some saturation, some color, and some characteristic. And let's let the the like I mean, you look at the gameplay. It's like. Damn, it's like, yeah, on the one hand, it kind of looks like Obsidian made a Skyrim game or like Pillars of Eternity did a Skyrim. But on the other hand, it's like, no, it has a really fun and unique one of a kind art style that's that just pops and in, 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 in is all its own. And I really appreciate that. It's like somewhere in between like a like a Skyrim and a Sea of Thieves with its art style. Right. And I just I want more of this. I, I love it. I crave it. And to me, I'm like for for a company. Obsidian was one of the acquisitions that I felt like made perfect sense and I was always okay with this one. But for for a for a developer that was not technically part of Team Xbox until just a few short years ago, man, Obsidian really knows how to out Xbox pretty much every other Xbox developer um that that's 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 doing shit right now or at least in in recent memory because I feel like this game avowed from what we're seeing just embodies the spirit of what makes Xbox games really great. And this is, this is like the identity of Xbox to me. And I know it sounds weird when, again, we're talking about a team that wasn't Xbox owned until not too long ago, even though they have a deep rooted history with Xbox. It's just that this is that, this is that thing I'm always ragging on Sony about. It's like, I like God of War 2018. I thought it was a phenomenal game. I loved Spider-Man 2018. I love The Last of Us Part 1 and 2. I thought Part 1 was a lot better, but I like Part 2 as well. I love the Uncharted games. I, I really love what PlayStation does. Um, I really want to get around to Ghost of Tsushima someday. I feel a little shame that I haven't played that game yet. But at the end of the day, it's like, I really respect that Xbox knows how to like, give you Western RPGs and give you first person shooters and give you um, strategy games and give you more of the narrative, serious third person story driven stuff like with Hellblade. But with, with all of that variety, the, the, the reoccurring undertone and message of it all is like the game is fun. It's like, it's, I, I felt the similar way with Halo Infinite where it's like Halo Infinite kind of like Halo five feels a little, a little more mature in its storytelling, Halo 5 tries to be a little more mature than some of the previous Halo games with its character story in particular. But at the end of the day, it's still Halo. It's still shoot, shoot, boom, boom, zip line, all that fun stuff. And th- this game just looks like it has that in spades. That being said, Kronky, I agree with you completely. I think the way they... It's it's the way they talk about Avowed while they're showing the excellent gameplay that makes me like roll my eyes. And that's a reoccurring theme for me with this presentation is a lot of the developer talk. It's like, I love that the developers have the floor and that they get to message the game the way they want to. But I feel like some of these developers are squandering this opportunity because like they're they're talking some serious, boring nonsense. I'm like, they're like, oh, we just want in this quest line, you can do this or that. And the decision you make will have an impact on the world and the and, and the people in the village will remember the things you did. It's like, yeah, I know how these games work. It's like, I don't know. It's like Nintendo described the Mario game in this game. You'll be able to jump on the head of a Goomba. And when you do that, Goomba will go poof in the air and it will go bye bye. And that will have serious consequences as you play through the level because that Goomba will be dead. It's like, shut up, dude. I don't need to stop over. Like, stop trying to like fucking sell me a concept that is as old as time. Like, like, like I'm like, I'm fucking a child and I need to be, I need someone to explain to me how an RPG works. It's like, calm down. So like, I thought a lot of the developer commentary for this game, uh, kind of did the opposite of sell it for me. But at the same time, I don't need the developer commentary because I can just watch the, the gameplay. I can see the trailers that came before what we got today and see what the game is. It's, 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 it's badass. It's like, do you like games like fallout and elder scrolls? Did you like the outer worlds? Are you a fan of the pillar, pillar of eternities, uh, a, a game series? If you said yes to any of those things, this game will probably appeal to you in some sense. And to me, it looks incredible. I think the idea of having loadouts, they it, now they're leaning into the combat a little more. They made it a point to be like, it's not going to be just like hack and slash to get your way through combat, which kind of seems like a wink and a nod at like, 
I don't know, Skyrim. But they talk about how, like, you can have loadouts and, like, certain enemies uh, require different attack patterns and different kinds of weaponry and different approaches in order to take them down. There's a little more thought in the combat. I'm okay with a little bit of that. Like, I'm not, I'm, listen, I, I get it. I, I, even like playing Batman Arkham, I get it. It's like, oh, this enemy has a sword, so you got to pull the sword out of their hands before you can hit them. Or this, this enemy has a shock stick, so you got to attack them from behind so they don't zap you. It's like, I, I'm cool with that. I'm not saying I hate all combat that isn't just punch, punch, kick, kick. But, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a little more of that modernity, what we, what we get from modern games with its combat, where it's trying to be a little more thoughtful, a little more complex. But when you see the moment-to-moment -moment combat, it still very much looks like your typical Western RPG, first person kind of fallout elder scrolls style combat and it looks great <laughs> like it looks like a lot of fun and i don't know the movement looks good the game the game just looks like it feels good to play and i'm just very excited about this um i'm excited for the dialogue i'm excited for the funny moments i'm excited for the hijinks i'm excited for the oops fuck i didn't mean to kill him or oops fuck i didn't mean to, to pick that 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 um that word tracking and I, I, ah, shit, I got this. Ah, now he's mad at me. Now they're attacking me and do all like the stupid shit you do in these games uh, and, and, and get into the hijinks and the fun of it because it will be fun to create your character and get immersed in this, in this universe. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to this game. I think it looks so good. Commentary, boring, but the game itself, it looks so fresh. It looks so authentically Xbox. When I think about Xbox, I think about games like Gears of War, Halo, Forza, Fable. Nowadays, I think of Sea of Thieves. Sea of Thieves feels very authentically Xbox. I feel like Avowed, even though we haven't played it yet, very much presents itself in a way it has that energy of like a quintessential classic Xbox game. You know? Sometimes, you look like a game like Starfield, and it's like, eh, it's just kind of weird because it's Bethesda. It's not, it doesn't fully feel like Xbox. Avowed feels like an Xbox game. It feels like it's right at home. We talked last week, you know, someone wrote in with that great question. What are games that aren't Xbox games that just feel like Xbox games? You know, like Bioshock one, it's not an Xbox only game. It's not a, it's not an Xbox first party title, but it, it's an Xbox game. That's how avowed feels. Although it is first party. It just it feels Xbox. And I love that. I'm excited for it. It is still my most anticipated game of this year. And then it comes out this fall. I believe it. I believe it. I, I think they don't want to put a date on it because they clearly don't fucking have a date. And they know if they say like October 17th, it's going to get pushed back to November 23rd or whatever the fuck. I think that's like Thanksgiving. So probably not, but you know what I mean? It's, I, I feel confident this game will happen this year. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. It is, it is for sure my most hyped game. All right. That's the first one. That's that's the first time I'll be super hype. We'll get hype again when we get back to Indiana Jones. Uh, now we'll talk about Hellblade 2, which is a game that I, I think I'm a little more optimistic on now than I was before. So the problem I had with the presentation with Avowed, I have that problem times 10 with, with Hellblade here, where it's like, listen, I love that they're giving the developers the floor. They can handle their messaging. But I wanted to I wanted to lay my head on a pillow and go night night when these guys were talking because I didn't give a shit about oh we're working with musicians that do metal music and oh there will be voices whispering in Senua's head the whole fucking game you will be crawling in the mud and feel like a like a stupid inept underpowered baby in this game I'm like oh great I don't I don't care shut up they're like if you liked the first game it's more of that they 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 kind of unsold me on the game a little bit where they were talking about how they're like, uh, I think the voice actress that plays Senua was like, she's confronted a lot of her demons in her past, uh, that she, that she faced in the first game, but now she's going to continue her journey with this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, so you're like admitting that this isn't a necessary sequel. Okay, go on. But criticism aside, I'm a little more optimistic about this game because I, I really have a lot of respect that they were, Advertising almost as like a feature, as like a like something to just own. And uh, when when they said that it is a shorter experience similar to the first game, and I was like, "Fuck yeah!" You're not gonna try to pad this out. You're not gonna be like, "Oh, you guys liked the first game, that seven hour experience? Okay, we'll do it again with a higher budget, and we'll make it fourteen hours to to pad out your time." I, I really respect that they're like, "Hey, just like the first game, it's another short kind of immersive storytelling experience." So I'm I'm very much expecting a six to eight hour game out of Hellblade 2 and I think that's fucking great and then after the event um, it was revealed that this is going to be a $50 uh, game not a $70 full AAA game it's going to be a, a $50 well you know not AAA yes or no but to say that they're standing behind a reduced $50 price tag um, and that they're not even going to do a physical release for the game it's going to be digital only so game pass or digital buy no, no physical release 
And I actually have a lot of appreciation and respect for that approach because this is the game that they announced the Xbox Series X with. This is the game that, for some reason, <laughs> like Xbox has wanted to market and push and hype the most uh, ever since the Series X was revealed. And I think a lot of it just has to do with Phil Spencer seems to be really like this is maybe a little tinfoil hat of me to say, but Phil Spencer and some of the guys at Xbox seem to be really like chasing the dragon with that whole like, oh, we want we want our Last of Us, we want our Ghost of Tsushima style like mm, somber, serious God of War PlayStation style game, and I think they see that in Hellblade more than any other other projects they have, and so they keep pushing Hellblade because like, look how beautiful the presentation is, look how artsy it is, look how narrative driven it is, look how good the acting is. It's like it's like PlayStation. You guys like this, right? You want this, right? Should we give Senua a small child in this game? Would you like that? And so I think that's why Xbox keeps pushing it so fucking hard down our throats, but. The fact that they're willing to then admit, like, yeah, it's a $50 game. It's it's a shorter experience. Respect. Because this is the fucking thing I'm saying that we need more. We need a, an audience of gamers that can embrace and accept this. And I think Game Pass is the perfect platform to help normalize this kind of thing, which I've said in the past. And it's that not every game needs to be ooh, 40 hours minimum. But you could get 3,000 hours out of the game if you play it just right. Oh, if you want to collect everything, you're going to have to do at least 300 hours in our game. Our game is open world, which means the, the world is open to all sorts of gameplay styles. I love a game that's like, yeah, we have a very specific story to tell. It's going to take about 5 to 10 hours of your life. And it's very curated, linear. And, it's, and we're really proud of the experience that we've painstakingly crafted specifically for you to experience the way we intended it to be done so or whatever I'm even saying and and they're like and that's it it's $50 we know we know you're not going to be playing this game for five months straight we know you're not going to be playing this game when season two battle pass drops we know it's not that kind of game so enjoy it 50 bucks that's it this is what we got and that's awesome I think we need to normalize this I think we need more of this you know Obsidian made Pentiment uh, two years ago Smaller game, twenty dollars, two D, hand drawn art style, whatever, just very indie style game look. We need more of that. Why? Why can't Ninja Theory make a game like that? Why? Why can't Three Four Three make a game like that? Why can't anyone make a game like that? I love that. A game developers' ambition or artistic vision should not be restricted to the 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 kinds of games they've been known for. You know. You know, 343 three, three should be able to make a $20 small-scale bite-sized game. And uh, Moon Studios should be able to make a fully AAA third-person open-world heist game, whatever the fuck they want to make. Like, everyone should be able, you know, obviously certain teams are built for certain things based on their history and their staffing and all that kind of stuff and the expertise they have on staff. But I'm just saying, like, whatever the ambition and intent and desire of the creator is, I think they shouldn't be restricted by what they've made in the past or what people expect out of a game. And so the fact that they're, they're proud and able to come out and be like, yeah, it's a $50 game. It's a digital only game. It's a shorter experience. I'm like, fuck yeah, respect. Also, thank you for being respectful of my time because I will gladly give you seven hours of one weekend of my entire life to play this game, but I don't want to give you five weekends uh, with seven hour play sessions until I hit, 30,000 hours so you know Senua can find out that she's allergic to pine nuts and figure out that's why she hears voices in her head or so whatever whatever the, her head she has one head uh then and, and, and I don't know it's just I, th I thought that was really cool that they did that I see a lot of people complain Ooh, no physical release isn't that what killed Alan Wake 2 no in fact this is the inevitable future I don't know if you guys know this but um the Xbox Series S is far out selling the Xbox Series X and it doesn't even have a disk drive so yeah, I mean, this is the inevitable. What did you think was the future, man? Like, what did you think we were working towards? I'm not saying shame on you for liking physical games. I very much respect people who like their physical media, and I and I feel for you that it's in some form a, a dying medium for you guys, and it's, it's becoming harder. But like, yeah, they're admitting like this is a a smaller Game Pass title. That's great. Bring it on. But uh, yeah, I thought I thought the commentary surrounding you know what they were talking about was was boring as all hell. But one thing that did intrigue me was they were saying the gameplay experience for the most part is pretty similar to what you had with the first game, but with a much higher production quality. Uh, but they were saying that the one gameplay thing that's different, they says the combat, they said the combat is all new 
And they don't want Senua to feel like some overpowered god. They want her to feel like someone who is struggling to survive. So the whole point of the combat is when you when you make it through a combat scenario, you feel that like, ooh, just barely made that. Or like, oh my god, that was tough. That was grueling. Which is cool. I like that. I like the idea of trying to, not like, ooh, that was so hard, but I made it through. But more like that feeling of like, yeah, that wasn't, I could feel that struggle. It wasn't just like, oh, I've mastered the kick button. So when I hit the kick button, the character kicks the character in the head and it deals the same amount of damage as it always does. I like the idea of it's like, you feel kind of, hmm, how do I want to say it? Like the suspense or the anxiety, like you wouldn't like a, a thriller or a horror style game where it's like, oh my God, oh my God, are we, gonna, are we okay? Are we going to survive? Are we going to make it? And I like the idea of like using that to translate the emotion of, you know, Senua's overarching narrative, her, her thing about her struggle and her overcoming of, Whatever the hell it is, I don't even remember what the first game's about at this point. I just remember enjoying it and moving on with my life. So I, I thought that was cool. I appreciate it. I like that. A little disappointing hearing it from Ninja Theory because Ninja Theory is a team that is historically so fucking good at making games where you feel like a god and you have badass combat. So it's, in a way, I mean, there's something like artistic in them taking their ability to do that and then trying to intentionally restrain it to make a certain type of experience a different type of experience. So that's cool. I think that's really cool, but... Um, that, that got me, got me a little interested. It's not exactly what I look for in a game, generally speaking, but I appreciate, I appreciate their intent and what they're trying to set out to do here. And I'm still optimistic about Hellblade 2. I know a lot of people feel like I'm just like, I'm shitting on this game. I'm not. I, I really enjoyed the first one. I don't remember it very well because I, I didn't, I didn't have the same emotional takeaway that I feel like a lot of people did, but I did enjoy it a lot. I thought it was a, a really great experience. I wish they had moved on and done something else afterwards, but if this is what they want to do, Hellblade 2, and here we are, we're at the home stretch. It comes out May 21st in just a few months here. Um, I think I think the game looks good. It looks like it's come together quite nicely. I respect their their vision for this game, and I respect the way that they're talking about it with being upfront about what it is and not trying to sell it as something else, and that's pretty cool. So I feel a little bit better about it. Before it was like, hey, yeah, I'll play it out of obligation, but I'm not, you know, I hope it's exciting when I play it, but I'm not really crazy about it. Now I'm a little more like, yeah, I'll definitely play it. it looks looks pretty good. I'm, I'm excited for a comfortable, easy weekend experience with Sen Senua Saga, and then I'll move on with life. So that was, uh, yeah, not not much in terms of moving the needle, but with these first two games, it's, yeah, uh, avowed, still my most hyped game of the year, Senua Saga, Hellblade 2. A little more interested, but overall, still pretty much like, yeah, I'll play it. Then we got, I thought this was cool. I, I don't necessarily care so much about the next game they showed, which is Visions of Mana, but I really do appreciate the way they did it because they promised us four games and then halfway through the showcase, they go, ah, 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 we got a little special surprise. And I thought it was really cute the way they presented it in the show where they're like, oh, we got a new notification. Oh, let's click on this. And then it showed a little, uh, ooh, incoming brief from Square Enix. I thought that was really fun. This is their um, Xbox cares about the Japanese market. We're trying to get more... Japanese games support on Xbox, which I really appreciate how honestly aggressive they have been about this. So they showed Visions of Mana. This is a game we've known about that's been announced for a little while. We know it's also coming to PlayStation. No surprise there, but this is going to be a Game Pass game. This is going to be uh, a game that is heavily associated and marketed with Xbox. And so we got a really nice deep dive and gameplay feature of this. I'll be honest. I had no intentions of playing Visions of Mana. And after seeing this video, I went from like, yeah, I don't, don't care. I went from that to like, I'm still probably not going to play this game, but I got to admit, it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look bad at all. It's got a little bit of Dragon Quest energy. It's got that combat looks a little, you know, like your typical JRPG, like modern JRPG action combat, like uh, like the new Final Fantasy games or like, dare I say, Kingdom Hearts. You know, they're talking about like being able to throw your enemies up into the air and hack and slash them and stuff. I'm like, I'll, I'll be honest, for as much as I don't care about Kingdom Hearts, I, um... I find the combat in Kingdom Hearts to be kind of fun. Um, so, like, I don't know. I'm looking at this. I'm like, combat looks good enough. The art style is fun. It looks like a like a decent time. Like, I'm 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 not put off by what I'm seeing here. It's just I don't know. Summer is usually a dry time, so it, it's coming out this summer. If they can hit this thing in like June or July, uh, that would be perfect timing. Sometimes people say summer and they mean September. Um, so if, if they can actually hit like a June or July release date with this thing. I think I might give it a try just for curiosity's sake through Game Pass, but it's not really anything for me. But I, at the end of the day, I really respect one. You know, they promised us four games and gave us five. That was awesome. I love I love a surprise. Doesn't always have to be the game you're looking to see, but you know, surprise is welcome. A nice little 
pleasant pleasant game we weren't otherwise envisioning seeing today. Uh, but not only that, but their their continued dedication to trying to get Japanese support. I know it's, you can tell it's hard for Xbox. You can tell they're trying. You, you know, and on the one hand, they're like, "Ooh, we're getting Persona Three on Game Pass, yay!" But then the same breath, it's like we're losing Final Fantasy to PlayStation as they get their billionth Final Fantasy game exclusively. And Square Enix is definitely the biggest offender of this shit. Where they're they they don't mind being like, "Fuck you, Xbox. You get nothing. Fuck you, Xbox. Here's a small little, th- you know, they'll be like, here's." Octopath Traveler, here's Visions of Mana, but the big stuff, the stuff people really care about, you know, Final Fantasy 16, fuck you, that's for PlayStation only, so it, you can feel Xbox is trying, they're trying to get what they can, and it always feels like scraps, oh, a, a port of Persona many years later, uh, oh, the the smaller Visions of Mana game, as opposed to the new Final Fantasy that comes out in a few months, it's, it's better than nothing, but again, always appreciate it, and thank God for Sega, because Sega's the Japanese company that's really helping Xbox to continue to have some kind of uh, Japanese support of, of substance. But I thought this was a cool surprise. I pre again, I really just appreciate the format of this event. And I thought this was this cool the way they did this little surprise. And while the game is not something I genuinely care about all that much and have much to say on, um, I, I did think it was a fun little surprise and the game doesn't look half bad. Now, speaking of games that don't interest me, I just gotta be honest. This is what I said last week. I gotta say the same thing this week. Aura history untold coming out this fall so we saw that this is the next game they showed i think this game looks like a wonderful world strategy game um if you liked civilization i think this game looks like a really great evolution of civilization but i have to be honest i do not care for these games i do not have much history playing these games and i do not have much interest in ever trying these games does not mean i hate this game does not mean this game is not going to be great does not mean I have any ill will towards Oxide Games, the developer of the game. I hope this game fucking kills. Uh, and I believe it's coming to PC this fall and then it will come to console later, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I have no ill will towards this game and I hope it fucking crushes. I hope it outsells Hogwarts Legacy and Elden Ring combined. But the thing is, it's just it's not something I care about. And for the 10 minutes or, sh- or so that they showed the game... I cannot sit here and lie to you guys and say, oh, I thought the game looked really interesting. I don't, I'm not one of those like Xbox Twitter shills that's going to like suddenly become a fan of this style of game just to support my green team. Like I don't, I don't care about Aura History Untold. Seeing 10 minutes of developer commentary and gameplay footage didn't move the needle for me one fucking bit. And all I can say is it's coming out this fall. I hope the people that are looking forward to it think the game is wonderful when it comes out. I hope it's a smash hit. And I hope it's a great get for Game Pass, and I will never, ever play this game. I just, I just don't care. Honesty. <laughs> All right, and then the last game, and this is, of course, the, you know, the, the big hitter. This is the one that everyone was here for. The, the, the number one thing people were looking forward to is, of course, Indiana Jones, the official reveal. I, I still gotta say, I'm surprised. I don't know what it was, like, I, if this was just off my radar If I successfully just told myself back in 2021 when this was first announced, do not look forward to this game for a very long time. It's not coming anytime soon. I really thought this game was going to be like a 2025 at the earliest type of game, probably 2026. So the fact that we're getting Indiana Jones and they're saying it's a 2024 game, shocking. Now, I don't know, where do we want to start on this? Okay, we'll get back to the date thing. They, they showed the reveal. Okay, we saw it. It's called Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. Terrible name. That's the worst thing I will say about this game. Terrible fucking name. But aside from that, in which names don't matter, you know, fucking Xbox One was a terrible name. Now I don't care. Xbox Series X was a terrible name. Now no one cares, right? Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. Terrible name. Don't care. The game itself looks phenomenal. I am very excited about this game. In fact, I'm so excited about this game that it's... Almost given, uh, avowed a little bit of a run for its money in terms of my most anticipated game of 2024. But that being said, I am still looking forward to avowed just a little bit more. But I think Indiana Jones in the Great Circle looks just absolutely beautiful. Um, the aesthetic and the tone of Indiana Jones, absolutely nailed. Machine Games, you have done a phenomenal job with this game. It looks and sounds so much like Indiana Jones. They got Harrison Ford's likeness, which is awesome. It's voiced by he's voiced by Troy Baker, uh, which of of course because Troy Bo- Troy 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 Borker, uh, Troy Baker uh, voices like I feel like eighty five percent of male characters in the games industry, so that should be no surprise there. But um, 
whatever. Who cares? The the model they made looks like Harrison Ford. He's got the mannerisms of Harrison Ford. And watching these cut scenes and this trailer they showed, it looks like a fucking Indiana Jones movie. Like, it looks it, it just much in the way that, like, these new Star Wars games look and feel like Star Wars. And, um, you know, the Batman Arkham games just look and feel like Batman. This looks and feels like Indiana Jones. They fucking did it. That's what's so cool about this modern era of gaming is we're at a place where presentation is so high that... You know, we used to get Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Spider-Man games and shit back in the day, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And they were cool. They were great. But they they they, they did feel like what you saw on TV. And we're at this point now where like these Spider-Man games, these Harry Potter games, these Star Wars games, this Indiana Jones game, they just they fucking killed it. It like this. This is Indiana Jones in a video game format. And it looks phenomenal. First and third person. Uh, when I was watching the presentation, I know this was a big talking point when this game was a fir- was first initially revealed because everyone's like, yeah, Machine Games, they, they make first-person games. Why would you do a first-person Indiana Jones? I thought as soon as I was watching the presentation, oh, Twitter's going to have a fucking field day complaining about this, aren't they? Um, it's When you play the game, it's in first-person. And then when you're doing like, when you're like interacting with objects or swinging from a vine or with your rope or something like that, or you're in a cut scene, it's in third-person. I thought people were going to be a little harder on this. It seems like most people are pretty okay with this. I don't know. I could I could talk about this topic a lot because personally, I almost always prefer first person. I love first person. I think first person is way more immersive. I generally find first person to be a more fun perspective to play in. And I enjoy that quite a bit. But man, you have Harrison Ford's likeness license for this game. You're making an Indiana Jones game. People want to see indie on the screen, you know? Like people don't want to... People don't want to see just all the enemies. They don't want to see Harrison Ford's hands. They want to see Indiana Jones. So I feel like they try to do this compromise by having this third person, like when you climb a ladder, when you swing from a rope, when you're in a cutscene, you'll you know when you're interacting with a wall or whatever, you'll see third. It, the camera will pull out and it'll be third person. But when you're playing moment to moment gameplay, it will for the most part be in first person. And again, I'm okay with that because I get it. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Um, by, by doing what they're good at, which is first person games. And I love first person. So I'm all for that. But like, I just thought people were going to bitch and moan about this. Like, Hey, it's a, it's a, it's a Indiana Jones game. I would like to see Indy in the game, you know? Um, so I'm a little surprised that people seem mostly okay with this decision, which is pleasantly surprising from coming from the internet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I'm a little surprised by it. You would think that Disney would have stepped in and be like, it has to be third person. Like, for marketing purposes, for sales purposes, like people, like the the massive swath of casual gamers who pick up this game, who go out of their way to play Xbox, to play the Indiana Jones video game, are going to want to see Indiana Jones. But then again, Hogwarts Legacy was the best-selling game of last year, and you didn't see one goddamn Harry Potter in the whole game. So who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe audiences are a little bit more matured and, and, and okay with these things than I thought they were. I don't know. I watched the Star Wars community have a fucking meltdown when they when they only got 12 minutes of Luke Skywalker screen time in The Last Jedi. So uh, I, I just, I guess, I guess maybe that has something to do with why my expectations for people are so fucking low is because I just, I really expected to go to Twitter and just be like, mm, Indiana Jones looks so dumb. It's not even in third person, LOL. Um, so anyway, that's the first part. Pleasantly surprised. People seem to be okay with it. I'm of course okay with it because I love first person games. Plus that's what Machine Games does. You know, they make, uh, Escape from Butcher Bay. They make the um, Wolfenstein games, and so that they do first person. That's what they're there for. And this is just a continuation of what they're good at. The other thing I want to say about the perspective, though, um, was this: that it's kind of funny when you think about it, because making an Indiana Jones game, like a triple A, true modern Indiana Jones game, is kind of a tricky thing because you run the risk of people being like, "Oh, that's just an Uncharted ripoff." Oh, that's just a Tomb Raider ripoff. But then you have to go back and remember, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tomb Raider came out because it was like a video game knockoff of Indiana Jones. It's like, what if Indiana Jones was a video game? That's how we got Tomb Raider in the first place. And then Uncharted was like, all right, now we're going to try our own, our own take on like a Tomb Raider style game. And that's how we got Uncharted. And now we're getting an Indiana Jones game. And it's like, well, it's like, you don't want to be seen as like an Uncharted knockoff because that would be a lot of people's first instinct is that this game's probably going to be like Uncharted or something, right? Um, so I, I just thought that was really funny, but in a way, simply just putting the game in first person negates so much potential and possibility for that criticism to, to, to come up in the first place because 
the perspective just changes so much of a game of a game's look and feel that immediately, like even if the game does have a lot of similarities with a game like, you know, the newer Tomb Raider games or Uncharted or something, it's like just the simple fact that you play in the first person perspective is going to negate so much of that criticism. So in a way, I don't know if that was a, a deciding factor in going with first person, but it certainly helps negate that kind of criticism, I, I think. And so that's another thing I want to mention about the perspective. But anyway, the game looks beautiful. The music's on point. You got the whip. You got the pistol. You got the fucking punching Nazis in the face. And doing that in first person is going to be extra badass because it's going to feel a little more, you know, a little more like you're going to feel more of that contact, more of that kind of like that that kinetic feeling of just like, oh, yeah, this is like hand-to-hand combat. So I think it's... I think it's really cool. I think it looks like they got a fun game on their hands. The, the the premise of the story, like from what you pick up in the trailer, it's like all these national landmarks all have these whatever latitude and longitude points. And when you put them on a map, it all lines up as a perfect circle or something like that. It's like, okay, I can I can see they're building up to some Indiana Jones type shit. There's going to be some some crazy reveal or something supernatural happens towards the end of the movie. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that plays out. You know, it's very much an Indiana Jones game. They say it takes place uh, in between the events of Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Last Crusader, so it's like okay, so it's very much in the in the time period of everyone's favorite Indiana Jones. So I think this is this is great. This is overall basically everything you could have asked for from an Indiana Jones game, and the overwhelming positive reception that 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 this trailer that this reveal got has me super excited because it's just it's just cool to see people excited about stuff. I feel like this is one of the rare examples where it's like. Xbox delivered on a thing and now people are excited about the game and it's just mostly pure excitement kind of the way people get excited about a new PlayStation game or the way people were excited about like a like Hogwarts Legacy or Elden Ring or something it's like people are just excited about the game because it looks really good and that's 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 exciting and comforting to know that Xbox is possibly capable of having a game like that uh, it seems like I don't know just anytime a good Xbox game comes out it seems to get a lot of shit so Good on you, Indy. You might you might break the streak. I don't know. Um, important to note, they no PS5. The game is set for 2024. Xbox Series S, Xbox Series X, PC, day one game pass, no PS5. So a lot of this, is it multi-platform thing? I, I still think there's a good chance this game comes to PlayStation at some point in time, but it would, you know, like my running theory suggests, it would be once the game's a couple of years old, once they've made their money on Xbox, once the initial hype's died down, once they've gotten their big swath of Game Pass subscribers because people want to check out the game, then they can go and sell it for 70 bucks on PlayStation a few years from now if they want. I have no problem with that. I think that's kind of a smart way to do it. Uh, but at least for now, it seems like it is a true Xbox exclusive. Um, let's see what else. 2024. Okay, so this was the only one that didn't have more of a firm date. Ara, fall 2024. Visions of Mana, Summer 2024. Avowed, Fall 2024. Senua Saga, very specific, May 21st, 2024. So those games, I feel good about those games coming out this year, you know? Indiana Jones with its vague 2024 date, no chance in hell. I I think, I hope I'm wrong. I think for sure this game is getting delayed to 2025. I do not think Indiana Jones is a 2024 game at all. Maybe, Maybe it's their May 2025 game. Maybe <laughs> I wouldn't even be surprised if it was a fall 2025 game. I hope I'm wrong. I just, you know, I seem to recall that when this game was revealed in 2021, early that year, they hadn't even really gotten to work on the game proper yet. They basically just put together a title screen and, and announced, Hey, we got the licensing to do an Indiana Jones game. And, you know, fast forward to now, it's like, that's, it's been like three years, man. Games these days are not made in less than five or six years. So I just find it hard to believe that this game's coming out this year, but I hope I'm wrong. The game looks great. I'll be really excited if we get to play this game this year. Um, I'll be okay if it gets delayed. It won't be the end of the world, but my money is on this game is not coming out in 2024. Uh, looks great, though. They have puzzles in the game. You, you expect that. There has to be some puzzle solving. It's an Indiana Jones game after all. Um, as long as it's the kind of like light puzzle solving makes you feel smart even though you didn't do much kind of thing you know it's like like on the tier of like a tomb raider or an uncharted game with its puzzle solving i think that'll be a, a great way to break up the action and the exploration of the game and i don't know i just think this game looks super exciting i'm really into it um yeah indiana jones is like it's it's like the one nostalgic ip right now that i can think of where i don't feel like this this ip has been run into the ground like the first three movies everyone likes the first three movies they're all great 
I I don't think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is as bad as people say it is. It's not the best indie movie, but it's I actually kind of like it. I think it gets a little bit of an unfair rep. And then the the Dial of Destiny, the one that came out last year, that movie, I have criticisms of that movie, especially with some of the things about the ending. But for the most part, I actually really enjoyed the newest Indiana Jones movie. And so I'm, I feel like hot on the IP right now. I feel fresh on the IP right now. Like I'm very familiar with it. Um, I'm really excited about this game. I feel like it hasn't been done to death the way that like, the way that like star Wars has been done to death. And I'm just, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic and excited for this really good looking Indiana Jones game. So shout out to that. Shout out to Xbox. This is, seems like a bona fide win, but then again, at some point, so did uh halo infinite feel that way. And so did Redfall feel that way. And so did Starfield feel that way. So who, who fucking knows how this, how this actually plays out. But that was the developer direct. You guys, I thought we had a pretty great setup here. Indiana Jones, Super exciting. Hellblade 2 looks pretty good. Avowed, super exciting. Um, overall, I, I thought what they showed was good. I just wish they uh, tamped down on some of this, like, just empty talk that some of these developers do where we really want to make players feel like they have the agency to walk around in our game and explore every nook and cranny. Using a series of buffs and debuffs, players will be able to equip the items that will be equipable in their menu selection screen. This is an inspiration we took from other games we've worked on in the past. Games such as that last one we put out, followed by the game we'll probably put out in the future. We really think players are going to find a lot to love in this game with its world that is unfolding, ever-changing, and strategic, and its, and its, and its access to the, to the player's un, un, unbalanced diaspora whatever words they're just saying shit they're just they're just talking and i and i'm like i went back and rewatched all of the indiana jones section all of the um hellblade section and all of the um avowed section just to rewatch see if there's anything i like i didn't pick up on the first time and it's like half of what they're saying it's just nonsense it's like listening to someone read the dictionary they're just saying words man but anyway, that's fine. If that's how you choose to spend your 10 minutes of fame, talking about Harrison Ford's likeness, that's fine. The games look great. I'm excited. Xbox 2024 looks looks like a really promising year. I don't think Indiana Jones is coming out this year. I'm going to stick to that. I owe everyone listening to this podcast right now $20 if this game comes out by the end of the year. But I do not think it's happening. Yeah. I think that's everything I had to say for now. All right. Um, yeah, I'm excited to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Please feel free to write in. Definitely want to see how uh, how the audience feels about the game, about the, the showcase. And uh, let's wrap up with a couple of uh, smaller news stories. So we got some Game Pass updates real quick to go through. So available this week through Game Pass. Those Who Remain is now on Game Pass. Turnip Boy robs a bank. Apparently that's kind of getting a lot of play. I wonder if that's any good. It's getting a lot of marketing hype. It's a day one Game Pass game. F1 2023 is on Game Pass through EA Play. And then one I'm looking forward to playing this weekend, Pal World. Uh, it's a day one Game Pass game. This is that Pokemon with guns game. I think this game looks pretty interesting. And I'm definitely looking to give it a try. Um, so that's for sure something uh, I'll, I'll be digging into this week, uh, this weekend, along with Batman Arkham Knight. Uh, but then coming soon to Game Pass, we got Go Mecha Ball, which is a day one Game Pass game coming out January 25th. On January 30th, we got Brotato, which is another game that's getting a lot of marketing play with Game Pass. And then uh, February 2nd, day one Game Pass game, Persona 3 Reloaded. It's a big one uh, for the Japanese support. And then on February 6th, we get a- Anushard, Anuchard, whatever, cloud console and PC. And then on January 31st, as with the case, as is the case every month at the end of the month, we lose a couple games. This month, we don't lose too much, just F1 2021, which is fine because we're getting F1 2023, so they're just replacing it with the later, latest version. And then we also lose Hitman World of Assassination, which I think is the collection of Hitman games. So that's actually a pretty notable loss, unfortunately. But, um, you know, go ahead and play it now while you still can if you want, or get 20% off the purchase if you buy it between now and the end of the month. So that's it for all the big news. we got a couple of important enough news stories, stories important enough to make the podcast, but not important enough to warn their own discussion. So let's blast through these. From VGC, VGC, Bethesda's announced that the de- they've delayed Starfield's big update with over 100 fixes and improvements. Uh, they just need more time to work on it, so that is currently being delayed. Next up, Rocksteady co-founders Sefton Hill and Jamie Walker have reportedly formed a new studio called Star Games, 
We talked about the torture development of Justice League or Kill the Justice League. Well, there's a reason why those uh, co-founders left about, what was it, a year or two ago? And uh, now they've announced a new team. So they're putting together a new a new studio, and we'll have to wait and see over time what that turns into. Um, next up, 11-Bit Studios has released the first gameplay trailer for Frostpunk 2, and it's confirmed it has a Game Pass Day 1 title. Frostpunk 2 will be released on PC in the first half of this year and then will be on consoles, including PS5, later in the year, but will be a Game Pass game. Um, or at a later date. They didn't say later in the year. They said at a later date, but I assume this year. Next up, Harmonix will be bringing an end it being bringing to an end it's eight years of rock band Four DLC support next week with the release of the final DLC piece, uh, which is going to be, what is it again? Oh, they didn't, it's not in what I, what I copied and pasted. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They're bringing their last DLC eight years of support. Pretty fucking good. All right. Next up, Larian studio CEO, Sven Vinky has said that the company will not be putting any of their games on subscription services like game pass. Now, they've talked about this a lot. They seem to be very not supportive of, of services like Game Pass, and this is them kind of reiterating that for the millionth time. But, yeah, they go in to talk about um, how they think it will always be king for having a great game that people can go out and buy, and clearly they're not fans of stuff like Game Pass, so they're just reiterating that. Um, next up, Swedish video game holding company Thunderful Group has announced to plan uh, that they plan to lay off about a fifth of their staff unfortunately. And then also dead by daylight studio behavior interactive will be laying off some of their staff. They said around 45 employees, according to some reporting from Kotaku, uh, that is the day dead by daylight team. Unfortunately, uh, the company's headquartered in Montreal, Canada. So more and more layoffs as things continue to get worse in the games industry. Uh, and then lastly, smite two has been announced during the smite world championship. I completely forgot about this game. I didn't know they were still supporting this game. Uh, the multiplayer battle arena sequel will arrive on PC and Xbox, uh, at some time in the future. No release date was given, but a alpha spring 2024 testing date has been confirmed at launch. The game will feature a bunch of different playable characters and blah, blah, blah. They'll bring games. They'll bring gods from the original game into this new game. Eventually, that's um Smite is an interesting one for me because uh, I, I've always just been vaguely aware of these guys just because um I always I always kept an eye on on uh, Smite just because the developer high, high res studios are from like where where I grew up literally like right down the road from me they're from Alpharetta Georgia they are I I, I literally used to drive past their studio sometimes like they were less than five minutes from the house I grew up in so I always just thought that I always felt so cool as soon as I found out that was a thing because. I was like, holy shit, a, a, a developer that makes like notable video games that people care about uh, is like right down the road for me. That's so crazy. It made me feel like I was close to something that mattered for a second <laughs> back in the day. And uh, yeah, but they're not making the sequel. The sequel is being made by a different team. It's being made by, um, let me pull it up here. Uh, the sequel is being made by Titan Forge Games, who I don't recognize. I'm not sure what they, uh, I'm not sure what they are known for. So that's that's a different team working on that. But nonetheless, Smite 2 is happening. So it's a lot more time than I thought we'd be spending on Smite. But that's it for all of our news this week. You guys, we're done. With the exception of our closeout section of the podcast, our final segment, the comments, the shout outs from YouTube.com. You know how it goes. You go to YouTube.com, click on Xbox on the latest episode of the podcast. It's at Xbox on on YouTube.com or YouTube.com slash Xbox on whatever uh, you, you click on the podcast, the latest episode. You leave a comment. You can say anything you want to say. Also, I'd appreciate it if you go over to YouTube.com, leave a nice five-star, or YouTube.com, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast service you use, leave a five-star review. Say, Jesse is amazing. I like the way he spins around his chair while he talks to a microphone for two and a half hours. It's quite compelling. And then people will be like, ooh, I want to listen to that. And then they'll listen to the podcast, and then we'll have more listeners and more followers, and then more people on the internet will say the things that I say. They'll repeat me, and they'll be like, Jesse says in Xbox on 242 that Avowed reminds him of the Xbox 360, and then people will complain, and then Twitter will have a picture, and they'll be like, this guy's a fucking idiot, and they'll have like a weird NFT photo of me, and then it will sell for a million dollars, and then I'll be famous, but I won't have the rights to my, they'll own the likeness to me because they bought the NFT, um, so I'll be shit out of luck, but that's okay, I'll have this podcast, so that's great. All right, we got five write-ins today, uh, a lot of you guys wanted to respond to our conversation from last week about the Xbox Series Pro console, the lack of a Pro console this generation. PlayStation 5 Pro is all but confirmed, um, but Xbox is seemingly not doing that. 
and we talked about that last week. So a couple of you guys wrote in. Cronky's going to kick us off here. He says, sorry for so many comments, but I have to jump in on this one. You mentioned the most powerful console thing and then did not, uh, and then not doing a mid-gen refresh. And then another commenter was like, whatever, no one really cares. Well, I'm that person who really cares. As a recovering PC gamer, you're welcome here. Uh, I really do care about the way games look and making sure they look their best when I play them. That's why I love auto HDR and FPS boost on old games. So I really hope that happens. Uh, the documents that were leaked were super old. So I'm actually pretty hopeful that this is that they still will make one of these. That's a great point is like the auto HDR and the FPS boost stuff that they do on older games. It plays into that like the most powerful console ever made 47 teraflops backwards compatibility with FPS boost. It's like you don't do all that shit. If there isn't some like quest for Xbox to be the console brand associated with the most powerful platform. And maybe Xbox is just giving up on that because they're seeing that's like beating that drum. Isn't doing anything for them and it's not winning them any market share. And so they're going to move away from that maybe, but I just don't think you do that. I think at this point you've made your bed, you have to lay in it. They have been, the beefy, powerful console manufacturer for the most of their existence. They've been the more powerful of the two uh, of the two Titans. And I, I just feel like they need to stick with this. So I, I'm with you. I think it, it matters for the optics of the brand. I think it matters for the most hardcore players who they need to cater to as they continue to lose more and more goodwill with people by potentially supporting things like PlayStation and, and making some of their most hardcore supported users feel a little burned or betrayed, which I'm not saying I have a problem with putting games on PlayStation, but I do understand why some people feel a little apprehensive about it in the sense that it's like, well, why the fuck did I buy an Xbox if PlayStation just has all the PlayStation games and all the Xbox games? So it's like, I don't know. You, you got to throw a bone to your most hardcore users every now and again, just to show that you listen, just to show that you care and just to flex your, Hey, we're who we say we are kind of thing. And, and, and I think sitting out the pro series console war thing is almost a way of, not being who you said you were. And so I just think that's important. I, I'm, I'm with you. I agree with this. And uh, even though I don't necessarily give a shit about a more powerful console, I think if they make one, I'll probably buy one because I am a bored, childless adult who needs an excuse to spend money. But it's not the end of the world for someone like me if they have it or not. But I think I think it matters. For the most hardcore, I think it matters. Now, Mr. Mal wrote in, about this as well and says, I get your reasoning behind why Xbox needs a Pro Series X, but in general, I feel like we don't need a Pro version of either console. They're both already quite powerful, and even though I always love having more power, we need better optimization instead. The Series X and PS5 already felt too soon when they came out, um, since we already had 1400, uh, 1400p by 2160p or 4K games on Xbox One X and PS4 Pro. Uh, yeah, but those weren't native. Isn't that the difference is that the new consoles have like native 4K? I don't know. I don't know anything. And uh, anyway, an issue I have with games right now is that they're coming out at 1440p using FSR2 to upscale to 4K. When we're supposed to be getting 4K60 native, having pro consoles will just make devs not optimize their games even further. Sorry for the rambling. Ha ha ha. Enjoy your weekend. Mr. Malg, that point, whatever. Let's just assume everything you're saying is right because I don't care or know enough about specs to be able to speak adequately to what you're saying. But let's put it this way. Optimization is something that individual developers have to figure out. The point I am trying to make is that the console manufacturer should not be the arbiter of where the performance cap is. Their job should be to give the developers the maximum amount of power they can possibly get to give the consumer the product that is as capable as can possibly be. And then it's up to the developers and the publishers and these people to make sure that their games come out as properly optimized as possible. I understand your point that like, if you give them more power and they're already not optimizing properly, you're just going to give them more incentive to be lazy. I don't think this is a matter of laziness and poor optimization. I think for, well, I do think there are instances of poor optimization. Gotham Knights is a, a clear example of that. So point taken to some extent, but I don't, I don't think this is one of those things where it's like Xbox should intentionally, hold back on giving more power as a way to incentivize developers to better optimize their games. I think this is a, they should put out the box that has the most capability and then it's up to the, to the consumers to support the games that either do or don't give them what it is they're looking for. And if serious top tier optimization is the thing that the market cares about, uh, not to speak so capitalistically, but you know, 
then the games that are optimized beautifully will will resonate and sell. The point is, the the truth of the matter is, the majority of gamers don't give a shit about oh 60 FPS and 4K. They just want the games to look really good. And whether it's 14, uh, whether it's uh, 1080p or 4K or 30 FPS or 60 FPS or 120 FPS, as long as whatever you do makes the consumer think, ooh, that game looks good. 99% of consumers are like, oh, I'm happy with that. And so I just think while some of us more nerdy and involved people want the native 4K, 60 FPS and all that experience, the bigger thing is just for marketing purposes and for serving your audience, you want to have that powerful box. So you can continue the message of we are the most powerful gaming platform. We offer the most, uh, the widest array of options to play everything from a introductory level with the series S all the way up to the most hardcore user for the series X pro. And it's on the developers and the publishers to make sure that they are putting out games that are properly optimized. And I don't want to hold one party accountable for the other one's shortcoming because that's not how this should work. In my opinion, although I do think to some extent your point is taken and I agree that to some extent there are optimization issues. It is, it is clearly a problem that so many games these days do come out completely busted or completely jank. And then within a couple of weeks, it's like, Oh, here's the patch that makes the game bearable. It's like, okay, how about next time you don't fucking put your game out until it's ready. So I'm with you, but I don't know. I don't know that I think Xbox should be held to any kind of account in terms of how like CD Projekt Red puts out their game aside from maybe, you know, it's on Xbox's, it, the onus is on Xbox to determine whether or not a game is up to snuff when they're allowing it onto their platform. You know, like if a game is completely broken, that's a different conversation. Xbox maybe should not be allowing that on their platform, but Xbox should not be blamed because they gave developers a more powerful toolkit to work with. And then the developers still didn't come out with the most refined product in the world. That's those are, in my opinion, two different conversations to be had, but appreciate you writing in Cronky. I think you make a good point as well. Mr. Mike Clark comes in with a little more of a simplistic, straightforward response to this whole ordeal and says regarding hardware. If you want a pro Xbox, build a PC, paint it green, put some gears of war stickers on it. Lol. Mike Clark, don't get cute with me, Mike Clark. Don't get cute with me. You know how it works. PC, no, P, the enemy the enemy of my enemy is a PC. And my enemy is also a PC. Fuck PC. No, I just, it's not the, it's not the same. Stop, stop. That's not the, th- This conversation was never about what I want. It's about what I think the right move for Xbox is. I'm, again, if, you, if, if I'm the only, if if me alone comprises 100% of the video game market, I'm totally fine to just use my Xbox Series X. Honestly, for another another 10 years, I don't give a shit. You can continue to make great games for the Series X and keep that thing going until 2034 and I will be fine. I'm so easy to please. I'm fine. I, I didn't even think the Xbox, you know, I knew the Xbox One had to be replaced soon because video game generations just don't last longer than eight years. But... I was still having a fine ass time with my day one Xbox one in 2020 when the series X came out. So don't ask, you know, don't, don't, it's not about what I want. I'm easy to please. I just, I'm just trying to think about what's the smart thing to do to control the Xbox brand. And honestly, I think there's maybe some unintended truth to what you're saying. I don't know how facetiously you even meant this comment to be, but I do think when we look at like PS five is outselling Xbox uh, three to one and, and why are people just not buying Xboxes? And Game Pass is such a great value. And they, they finally got the games coming. But people are still just not buying Xboxes. The more and more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know what? It's not that Xbox is losing to PlayStation. I don't think that's the case. I really do think, if you know, you, you're, maybe you're, you're on to something. I think Xbox is losing people to PC. I think the maybe part of the problem is that Xbox has positioned itself for so long as like, we're the high tech, we're the powerful gaming platform. We're the gaming platform for people who want serious power. And one of the unintended consequences of of marketing yourself and positioning yourself that way is that attracting that kind of gamer is ultimately just going to draw people to PC. Because if I'm the kind of person who just wants the highest spec console, the best thing on the market, it looks the best, it sounds the best, it plays the best, eventually you're just going to go, yeah, but everything's better on PC. And then you're going to lose that consumer to PC. And as more and more young people start to just go straight to PC, I mean, we're, I can't even fathom this because, I, listen, I grew up on PlayStation 1, Super Nintendo, N64, 
graduated to PS2, Xbox, GameCube. Like that's where I came from as a kid growing up with video games. So I knew PC games existed. I have played games on PC as a child, but like it's, it, it's beyond me that so many kids these days, like their gaming lineage is like, oh yeah, I started out when I was six months old playing my mom's iPhone 14 Max Pro. And then when I was two and a half years old, I upgraded to the iPad 14 X Pro Max. And then when I was six, I got a Nintendo Switch. But by age seven, I needed a PC because I watched Linus Tech Tips and Ninja, and they both told me I needed a GTX graphics card. It's like, I I understand that's like a large swath of young gamers these days. That, I, I can't compute, like, I can't relate to those kids. That's not like, oh, young kids, I remember what it was like to be you know, 10 years old and to want to play Xbox after school. Like I can't relate to these kids because what I was doing was innocent. What I was doing was PG and it was clean and I was coming home from school and I was like, I'm going to play some Halo or Mario or Sonic when I get home. And it was nice. It was clean. It was safe. It was fun. My parents knew where I was. There was nothing wrong with it. The kids these days, they come home from school and they're fucking pounding G fuel and they got like their fucking hoodies and their baggy pants with their Nike slides on and their poofy douchebag hair that all the 10 year olds have. And they're like, I'm going to watch Jake Paul and play Minecraft and, and Fortnite on my PC that costs $4,500. I, I can't fucking compete with these kids. And, and joking aside, it's like, I, I think that's kind of where Xbox is maybe losing I don't remember which PlayStation executive said it. Uh, I think, I think it was, I'm forgetting his name. I feel like an idiot. The last, the last guy that ran PlayStation before, man, what the fuck is his name? It's, it's driving me crazy. Sean Layden. Thank you. God damn. I'm pretty sure it was Sean Layden who had said that I could be misattributing this, but more or less he said that what they, what they have found is that the number, the pool of, of consumers that are willing to play console games doesn't for the most part doesn't really grow or shrink it's the same number of people but what every generation does is it gives you the opportunity to, to redistribute that pool of people which is like super fascinating and and honestly if you look at especially like the past two or three generations it kind of makes sense i mean the xbox 360 and the ps3 was like xbox 360 sold like 80 plus million units playstation 3 sold like 85 plus million units or so 83 something like that and so you can deduce or, or, or do some simple addition and be like, okay, there was like 150, 160, 170 million people you could have sold Xboxes and Playstations to. And then you look at like the Xbox One generation, it's like, okay, well, we know that Playstation 4 is sold around like 120 million units and Xbox One sold around like 40 to 50 million units all generations. Like, oh, well, when you add that up, that's like... Oh, it's like 150, 160, 170 million consoles. It's the same number of consoles, but just distributed differently. PlayStation got a bigger piece of the pie. And now you look at where we are with, obviously we're very, we're a lot earlier in the generation. So all is not said and done, but so far PS5 has sold, they say like almost 50 million units and Xbox series consoles all added up. have sold like 20 to 25 million units. It's like, all right, here we go again. We're on track. We're like three years into this cycle and here it is. It's like we're, we're on track to do something similar again. And so I only say that to say it could just be that more and more of those people who want to play on console are shifted to PlayStation because PlayStation have the games or they have the name recognition or it's where their friends are. Or it's just, you know, it's been around so much longer than Xbox. So it's like the safe brand that people just naturally gravitate towards while a lot of people on Xbox are either sticking with Xbox or they're graduating to PC. You know, Nintendo people stay with Nintendo because if you want to run around as Mario, you got to be on Nintendo. A lot of people stay with PlayStation because PlayStation has a great lineup of first-party games and it has a lineage and a history that keeps people who want to play console games that aren't Mario in the PlayStation sphere. Xbox is addressing their games problem, but they have marketed themselves as like the ultimate place to play the most high-fidelity blah, 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 blah games in so long. That like a lot of people are like, that's cool, but if I want high fidelity, I'll go play PC. And so I've been, I don't know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, but I don't mean it as like a real problem. I think Xbox's bigger competitor possibly, or, or the, the biggest thing they're up against is not PlayStation eating their consumers. It's PC eating their consumers, you know, taking them away. And, uh, 
maybe maybe that's a problem for Xbox. Maybe it's not. I mean, they put their games on PC, so that's good. I mean, that was a whole initiative in the Xbox One generation that's working out for them still to this day. And I mean, hey, all these PC games, they all these PCs that people game on, they're almost always Windows PCs, and they run. And a lot of these people have Game Pass on their on their PCs, and then. Xbox sells their games through Steam. So like, hey, if you if you're an Xbox gamer turned PC gamer, Xbox is still profiting off of you. And, and so all all's well, I guess, but that I think explains a lot of why no matter what Xbox does, the numbers just keep shrinking. They keep suffering more and more in the hardware space because people go to PC. But I still think I don't know. I, I, I'm holding on to this whole like Xbox versus PlayStation battle, not from like a console war perspective, but like in my head when I think about like what Xbox's main competitor is and where Xbox needs to put their their competitive spirit towards. It's to me it's always PlayStation because I'm like, that just makes sense. Like that's the closest thing to like a proper one to one competitor. But especially with the way Xbox is constantly evolving these days, it's like that PlayStation might not be the answer. That might not be the main competitor and we're seeing that more and more every day, but I don't, I'm getting to the point. I don't know what I'm saying. So that's that conversation wrapped up real quick. Mountain Dew comment. Tim R wrote in Tim, you wrote this comment as I was finishing the podcast last week. I I almost got it in the podcast. If you had written it in like 30 minutes sooner, I would have had it in the podcast, but it doesn't matter. All is well. Here we are. We're reading your comment. Now you said, I heard a rumor for the, from giant bomb. Um, that Baja Blast is going to be year round this year due to an anniversary of some sort. That is true. On the topic of Giant Bomb, I'd like to say your rant slash tangents to video games, tangent to video game talk ratio is much better than theirs, and they seem to be doing just fine. So, uh, yeah, I thank you. I, I don't know what to make of that, but I appreciate the feedback. I, oh, I see what you're saying. Like me, me being like insecure or, or questioning if I rant too much or, or talk. Okay, whatever. I think a lot of the, a lot of what does those other podcasts well is that they have people with inside information and they have more than just one guy who's schizophrenic. Um, well, no, I should rephrase that. Not that they have multiple schizophrenic guys, but they have more than one guy. So it's like a conversation between people unless they have one schizophrenic man just being like, oh, I, play, I play Batman. I'm trying to count my calories. Oh, play Xbox. So may, maybe that's the difference between Xbox on and Giant Bomb. But uh, no, respect to them. I, 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 I'm familiar with a lot of these other Xbox podcasts and gaming podcasts, and most of them do pretty great work. So, um, I'm I'm happy with my little uh, my little stake in the ground, my little uh thing I got going on here, and it's uh, it's all good. Mike Clark writes this out. <laughs> Thank you for writing in, Tim. Yes, Baja Blast is being sold all year, um, because it's like the 20th an- is it the 20th anniversary? Whatever it is, it's an anniversary. I don't know, man. I love Baja Blast. It's a great flavor, but I, I really do feel like I don't want it anywhere, anytime other than Taco Bell because Baja Blast, I've said this before, it tastes like Taco Bell. It's like if if another example is like it's like yellow Gatorade. I can't drink yellow Gatorade because my mom used to always give it to us growing up when we had like a stomach bug, whenever we were sick or you had like an upset stomach or you were throwing up. It was always like here, sip on a little bit of yellow Gatorade because the electrolytes and everything, you need the hydration. It will help. It will help make you feel a little better. So like that was when I would drink either ginger ale or yellow Gatorade was whenever I had like a stomach bug. And so I grew up hating ginger ale and hating yellow Gatorade because if I taste it, it just tastes like throwing up and being sick to me. Like I I can't stand it. So it's like same thing with taco with a, with a Baja blast. It's like, It was only available at Taco Bell for so, so long. And, you know, only in recent history have they started doing like the occasional, like for a limited time only, you can buy it in cans at the grocery store. So to me, it's like, that's great that I can go buy a 12 pack of Baja Blast at the grocery store. But because for so long, the only way to get it was Taco Bell. Anytime I drink Baja Blast, it's just Taco Bell. So like if I buy a 12 pack of Baja Blast, take it home and then I make like fucking chicken and mashed potatoes for dinner or something like that, I'll be like eating my green beans, eating my mashed potatoes, eating my chicken thighs or whatever. And it just tastes like Taco Bell because I'm washing it down with the Baja Blast. And that's it's the problem. It's, the flavor's great. It's a great drink. But I can't have it anywhere other than Taco Bell. So it's a conundrum for sure, but... It, generally, I, I, I address the problem by drinking one of the many other flavors of Mountain Dew. And so that is how I'm keeping my calories 
in check is just by drinking copious amounts of Mountain Dew. Anyway, thank you for writing in, Tim R. Hope you're having a wonderful week. And I just I just want to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a guess here. Let's see if I'm right. That haircut you got two and a half weeks ago, it looks really good on you. I think this is a really good style. And I hope it instills a lot of confidence in you because you look really good with that hair. So be proud of it. Keep up the good work. Have a great week. Final comment comes from Mike Clark. Here you are. You come back again. You, you, you fucking bastard. What do you want this time? No, uh, no headhunting Halo this week. We got Mike Clark. He writes us out with a, he, he, uh, what's it? Sends us off with a, with a big comment here. He says, love the podcast and had a few things to follow up with from last week's show. YouTube live show, Twitch sucks. I understand you have a life besides Xbox on, but I was just thinking about how you could get your numbers up. They are fun and they could have, you could have guests on or so. So maybe talk about some Taco Bell or maybe make some Taco Bell money. Uh, makes Make timestamps for the weirdos who don't like Disney. Okay, let me stop there. I do put timestamps on every episode of the podcast. There will be timestamps on this episode, just like there have been for every other episode of Xbox on. So please, Mike Clark, check the description before you comment. Uh, joking aside, uh, fake frustration aside, yeah, man, Twitch does suck, but for some reason, I just, I don't know, I like Twitch because it's black and purple, and I like the colors, I guess, I don't know. Um, I do need to do stuff on YouTube, I do, I want to go back to YouTube, I don't know, man, it's the same thing, if you've listened to Xbox on for a number of years, you know, you know me, I do the same thing, I do the, the introspective January thing where I'm like, mm, this year I'm going to learn how to play guitar at a higher level, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to just read tablature. I'm going to learn music theory and I'm going to be a guitarist. And this year I'm going to make a YouTube video every week, every all year. I'm going to do YouTube, whatever. And then by fucking March, I'm just like wallowing in Taco Bell rappers and I'm just scratching my butt cheeks, rewatching season three of community for the hundredth time. It's like, I don't, I'm not getting better, dude. It's not happening. YouTube live show. What a great idea. What a fun idea. And I could have people on the show with me. That is a genuine, fantastic idea. Watch me not do it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll joke is I don't M maybe someday it's hard, man. Like I would have loved to have done some, something live during the developer direct, but you know how I watch the developer direct hiding at my office uh, at work, hiding behind my desk, trying to pretend I wasn't there so I could watch TV on my phone and watch Indiana Jones be a video game instead of doing my job. That's, that's, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's hard. There are not enough hours in the day. You try to freaking, I don't know. It, day, days are rough, man. You, you wake up early, you go to work all day, you sit in traffic, you come home, you either make dinner if it's your week, or you clean up after dinner if it's your week for that. Either way, some work there. Try to spend some time with your girlfriend, try to go on a walk, get your steps in for the day, take a shower, get cleaned up. Maybe you got a little bit of free time. Am I going to read a book tonight? Am I going to play a video game tonight? Am I going to freaking spend some time with, with, with the girlfriend tonight? Do I pet my kitty? Kitty needs pets. You can't just not pet your kitty. It's hard. And then before you know it, it's like 1030. You're like, fuck, I got to go to bed because I got to wake up at five again. So it's hard. I'm not complaining. Life is good. I have a wonderful life. I'm grateful. But um, it's just hard to find the time to do anything. I, I want to do so much more, man. I would love, if I had more time, I would do a lot more YouTube. I would do a lot more live streaming and stuff. I just, I don't have the time. And when I do have the time, I don't have the energy. So that, that sounds like a lazy excuse. I mean, I, I suppose it is, but the one thing I, without a doubt, will make sure happens no matter what is I will get this podcast out to you every week when I say I will. But anything beyond that at this point in time, I just don't have something else in my life has to give in order for me to be able to do more stuff. And I just don't, don't have it yet. I wish wish I did. Maybe, maybe one day my job will go remote. Maybe one day, uh, I will win the lottery and I won't have to go to my job at all. Maybe one day, maybe one day they will come up with the technology for me to just uh, dream about a YouTube video. And then it will just be done when I wake up and then I'll be like, good. Didn't have to edit or, or work. I don't know. Until then we do it this way. <laughs> Ubisoft, are we serious? They just had their own Microsoft matrix. Um, oh, you're talking about the physical thing. We don't have to get into that. I, I left that out of the news intentionally. You, you made a couple of comments that are now kind of dated because they are leading up to the uh, the reveal. You said, I'm excited to see Indiana Jones and Machine Games. Please be a third person. And I'm hopeful that's coming this year. Uh, you got half your wish. I'm sorry, sir. Hellblade 2 and Ninja Theory is going to be huge. Easily my most anticipated Xbox game for the year. But Indy has my full attention. 
Well, I think you were probably pretty pretty pleasantly uh, happy with how that went. Uh, Avowed will be great. Hope the stylized graphics don't turn people off before they ever get a chance. It's an Xbox game, so I'm sure people will find a way to rag on it. He said, I finally played Wolfenstein the Old Blood, and it's and damn, Machine Games has the first-person action game perfected. Forgot how great the Wolfenstein series was. Amen, brother. That that Those games are phenomenal. I just convinced one of my friends to download and try it for the first time, so I'm very excited to see what he thinks of those. Anyway, you said enjoy the rest of your week. Look forward to the special episode on Friday. Well, yep, I, I'm going to go get to work on editing this bad boy and get it out to you guys first thing tomorrow morning. So that's it for the podcast this week, you guys. Take care. Be well. Thank you so much for listening, as always. Please really do, if, if, if you have the opportunity or the uh, the inclination to support the show by doing so, leave a five-star review. Um, I know I make the joke every week. Don't leave a review unless it's five stars, but um, in all honesty, yeah, don't leave a fucking review unless it's five stars. Have a wonderful week. Drink some delicious Mountain Dew. Make sure you think about your health while you're doing it. Uh, get your steps in. Uh, pet your kitties. Clean the dishes. Sometimes, you know, hey, I know this sh- this podcast is overwhelmingly uh, overwhelmingly male centric, fellas. Do her a favor. Sometimes, just 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 clean the bathroom, do the dishes, mop the floors. Something unprovoked. Don't don't make her ask for it. Just do it. You'll make her day. Show her you care. And show me you care by leaving a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Empower your dreams. Uh